Hello, everyone, and welcome to this joint meeting of the Geographical Sciences Committee and the Mapping Science Committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. I am Harvey Miller, and I'm chair of the Mapping Science Committee. We're glad to have you with us, whether in real time on Zoom or viewing the recording of this session later. Now, before we begin today's webinar, I'd like to say a few words about the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine and the Mapping Science Committee. Next slide, please. on the expertise of volunteers to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and to confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. Next slide, please. The Mapping Science Committee, a standing committee within the National Academies, was established in 1987. It addresses aspects of geographic information science that deal with the acquisition, integration, storage, distribution, and application of geospatial data. The MSC tracks and hosts discussions on mapping and geospatial industry initiatives and advancements with the goal of increasing collaboration and synergy among business, government, and academia. The committee also tracks international mapping and geospatial science research and technologies that may have value to the nation. The current members of the committee are Stuart Fotheringham, Oceana Francis, Hendrik Hammond, Kristen Kerlin, Marguerite Madden, Keith Mosbach, Kathleen Stewart, and Eric Tate. And we greatly appreciate their time and energy in helping the MSC be successful. Our sponsors are the US Geological Survey and the US Census, and we are grateful for their support. I'd now like to pass the mic to the chair of the Geographical Sciences Committee, Dr. Pat McDowell. Next slide, please. Thank you, Harvey. The Geographical Sciences Committee provides advice to society and to government at all levels using the methods of spatial analysis and representation. We address the geographic dimensions of human environment interactions, spatial location and concentration, and place-based research and policy at all spatial scales. The committee also fosters international cooperation by serving as a liaison to other national geographical organizations, including as official US liaison to the International Geographical Union. The current members of the committee are Budindra Baduri, Janet Franklin, Janelle Knox Hayes, Glenn McDonald, Elizabeth Root, and Don Wright. And thank you all so much for your service. The committee is supported by funding from the National Science Foundation. Next slide, please. In our meeting today, we will discuss ways to integrate qualitative or thick data with quantitative data to, re to construct a real-time understanding of forced migrations. We will also explore the gaps that need to be filled to improve this understanding, as well as the limits, opportunities, and errors associated with both qualitative and quantitative geographic data. We'll examine what qualitative data is available and the ethical issues around using these data. Finally, we'll discuss how we can visualize and communicate data sets that integrate qualitative and quantitative data. Our program today will consist of four sessions, a keynote and three panels. The committee has prepared a few questions for each session and will also take questions from the audience. So please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and understand that any questions you submit may be read aloud and included in our recording. A link to the recording will be posted on the MSC and GSC websites within the next few days. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Elizabeth Fussell. Dr. Fussell is Professor of Population Studies and Environment and Society at Brown University. She's a sociologist and demographer. Her research focuses on environmental drivers of migration and social inequalities in migration, health, and other post-disaster outcomes. Her talk today will focus on climate migration, displacement, and relocation. Dr. Fussell, 
Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, so I need to share my screen. Here we go. Great. So I join you today from um, Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and this is on lands where, which are within the ancestral homes of the Narragansett Indian tribe. The university acknowledges that the Narragansett Indian tribe was dispossessed from their lands by the forces of settler colonialism. And we acknowledge our ongoing responsibility to understand and respond to the legacy of those actions. This land acknowledgement is a really good starting point for this keynote address because it reminds us of the long lasting harm of forced displacement. I'm gonna to begin today's talk with uh, my own story about displacement that launched my research on this subject. I was an assistant professor in the sociology department at Tulane University in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina made landfall on August 29, 2005. The day before, as faculty, staff, and students were preparing for the new semester, a mandatory evacuation was called for the entire city of New Orleans and the lower-lying parishes. My husband and I got gathered our one-year-old daughter and our two cats, and we headed to Baton Rouge, from Baton Rouge, we traveled to Northern Virginia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and then back to New Orleans in time for the Christmas holiday. While on this journey, I wrote an essay for the Social Science Research Council's website, which was titled, uh, the website was titled Understanding Katrina. The website gathered essays from social scientists who study disasters, environment, and society. My essay, which is shown here on the slide, focused on social stratification, social networks, and the hurricane evacuation. All of these are topics which I continue to research. While I was in Philadelphia, the SSRC convened a meeting in New York City of several of the essay contributors, as well as interested members of the public. As a migration scholar, I was new to disaster research and I listened quietly and respectfully as scholars who had built their careers studying disasters debated whether it made sense to rebuild New Orleans. I immediately imagined all the reasons why rebuilding New Orleans made lots of sense. It is not uncommon to hear such comments about risky places after an especially devastating disaster. But this view overlooks all of the personal and societal loss that residents experience. And fortunately, one of my displaced friends who was in the audience, um, he's a Louisiana native who worked as a culture writer. He reacted quickly to this, uh, to this suggestion that New Orleans shouldn't be rebuilt. He spoke passionately about the meaning of New Orleans and other parts of the devastated Gulf Coast. And all of the millions of residents who built their lives there. As a resident and a researcher, I understood both perspectives. And we might think of each perspective as privileging different types of data. Residents have a multidimensional and historic relationship to a place that is not easily summarized in any metric. We can characterize that information from residents about their identities and their lived experiences as qualitative. Researchers, in contrast, seek to reduce information into a set of measures that statistically explain a large proportion of the variation in a range of outcomes. This is an inherently quantitative approach that privileges concepts that can be quantified, such as property loss and economic costs, and neglects the qualitative concepts that are more difficult to measure, like culture and community. Those of us attending this workshop today recognize the societal benefits to be obtained from integrating qualitative and quantitative data to produce timely information on forced migration. Such information is key to developing responsive disaster re recovery policies that produce an equitable outcome for all of the disaster affected residents. So today I have two objectives for my talk. 
First, I will orient you to conceptual issues in measuring forced migration. And these are the sorts of conceptual issues that preoccupy migration scholars. Second, I'm going to review data sets that have been used to estimate post-disaster migration quantitatively, and then talk about some of the challenges for combining it with qualitative data. I hope that this somewhat inconclusive ending will launch a good discussion about how to move forward. So turning now to concepts used in migration research, I'm focusing on this figure that comes from the United Kingdom Government Office for Sciences Foresight Project Report. The Foresight Project sought to understand how global forces, but especially climate change, will affect the volume and patterns of human migration in the near future, and how policymakers might address the root causes of migration. It's kind of a complex figure. I'm not gonna go over the whole thing, but um, I'm just gonna summarize a few of the widely agreed upon findings from the report on environmental migration. And we can define environmental migration as any migration influenced by environmental changes and events. So one of the first uh, conclusions is that environmental changes and events, whether those are temperature and precipitation extremes, sea level rise or extreme weather events, rarely have a direct effect on migration. They typically operate through the other drivers, which are represented here in the left-hand side of the panel as the five points of, on the Pentagon. And the especially relevant are the economic, driver, um, the economic drivers, the environmental drivers and the political drivers. Second, most migration influenced by the environment occurs within countries and usually over very short distances. This is true of most migration in general, regardless of the motive for, reason, for moving. Violence and political persecution are exceptional because those are the main reasons for, um, or those are reasons for international migration to flee political persecution. Uh, finally, environmental changes and events are as likely to prevent as they are to actually to produce migration. We see this on the right-hand side of the panel, which shows that contextual variables and household and individual level characteristics influence the migration decision. Therefore, migration is selective, meaning that certain types of people are more likely to move and others are more likely to stay. These findings can be reduced to a stylized fact about environmental migration. It is rare, usually short distance, and selective on individual and household traits. But what this figure doesn't show very well is that the migration decision is not always a completely free choice. Migration scholars are more attentive to how structure and agency interact in the migration decision. We define migration as any residential move by an individual or household that is permanent and crosses a geographic boundary. This broad definition of migration is inclusive of many subtypes of migration, which can be classified along three dimensions represented by this cube, distance, duration, and volition. I've shaded the back of the cube to represent migration at the involuntary extreme of the volition dimension. And the X axis represents duration and Y represents distance. Each dimension is a fairly intuitive uh, concept, but the challenge is to operationalize them. For example, the distance between origin and destination might be measured as which political boundaries are crossed or a linear distance or travel time. Similarly, duration might be measured by the time the migrant is observed to have lived in the new destination. In other words, how long they've lived in a new destination or by the migrant's intention for staying in that place. Volition is rarely measured directly because it requires the migrant to state their reason for moving. Usually volition is inferred from the circumstances under which a move occurred. So most residential moves are permanent, short distance, and voluntary. 
These are moves that happen alongside life course changes like marriage, cohabitation, separation, divorce, widowhood, and the search for housing appropriate to the changing size and needs of the household. Thus, they're usually very local. Longer distance permanent migrations are more often associated with employment and may fall somewhere in the middle of the volition dimension, depending on the options for in terms of employment. For example, uh, college professors are recruited to work in a university, but not necessarily the university in the city which they prefer to live in. And so that's a somewhat constrained choice uh, or migration um, choice. So our interest is in migration that is forced, that is driven more by the push factors than the pull factors. And these might include ha hazard evacuation, which would be an involuntary move that may not even be a migration because it lasts only a short period of time and involves only a short distance move. But an evacuation may become a displacement when destruction of the built environment is extensive and it takes a long time to rebuild the pre-disaster home or to find new housing. A displacement may become a permanent relocation when land loss or hazard exposure prohibits return to a pre-disaster home or community. Long distance moves across an international boundary are mo most likely when people are fleeing political persecution or conflict and may range in duration from temporary to permanent. Um, they, environmental drivers rarely contribute to such migrations. These types of migration often have push factors that can be temporally defined, making it easier to infer the reason for moving from those circumstances. And therefore, it's easy to label these as forced, even without talking to a migrant who would provide you with the reason for moving. However, many migrations occur in the ambiguous interior of this three-dimensional box where it is difficult to isolate a single driver of migration. And that was the point of the, of the foresight slide that showed that um, most drivers operate, uh, or the environment tends to operate through other drivers of migration. So these may be moves in response to gradual changes in the environment or the context, like a drought, repeated environmental hazards, diminished natural resource-based livelihoods, or political repression. In these gradually worsening conditions, potential migrants search for better employment or educational opportunities or something else, better housing. They search for that elsewhere, and thus they combine the push and the pull factors in, the, in their migration decision. All of these spaces within the three-dimensional conceptualization of migration are types of forced migration and each involves some degree of choice about whether, when, and where to move. So let's return to the conceptual framework. What I've just discussed about the temporal, spatial, and volitional dimensions of migration shows that the migration decision is not just whether a person decides to migrate or to stay in place. The decision also involves when to leave, where to go, whether to return, whether to settle in the new destination, and whether to continue migrating. All of these decisions, according to this model, depend on the, the macro, the meso, and the micro level factors that are identified in this figure. These factors are the structures and forces that constrain the migration decision by opening up some migratory pathways and closing off others. They allow potential migrants to exercise some degree of agency, even if there are very compelling push factors. So let's think about this model relative to the example of Hurricane Maria's effect on Puerto Rico. The hurricane destroyed housing and caused prolonged power outages throughout the island, causing many residents to consider whether they would be better off elsewhere, at least temporarily. Puerto Rican status as US citizens provided a pathway to the states and social networks connected some of them to friends and family in specific places like Miami, Orlando, New York City and other cities where Puerto Ricans had previously settled. 
Data from multiple source, sources estimate the population of Puerto Rico to have declined by about 100,000 residents between 2017 and 2018. So we infer that about 100,000 people moved permanently from Puerto Rico to the US states. This is a dramatic loss for sure, but it's only around 3% of the island's population of 3.3 million. Most Puerto Ricans did not migrate. They stayed and rebuilt their lives and communities. Outmigration was greater from the more devastated areas, and some quantitative evidence shows that migrants were more willing to be working, or sorry, not more willing, more likely to be working age adults who were most likely seeking work in the US to support the, fam the family that they had left behind. So what this case illustrates is that a humanitarian response to a crisis that has the potential to cause migration would be a policy that preserves and enhances residents' agency and allows them to exercise control over their residential outcome. In this case, migration was one of a set of possible responses to the crisis in Puerto Rico, but clearly not the only response. The well-traveled pathways to familiar destinations provided an option for many Puerto Ricans who were struggling with prolonged disaster conditions on the island. And we can imagine other examples where the migration option might have been more or less attractive depending on the push factors. But it's important to remember that even in a situation where we that we label as a forced migration, potential migrants or the actual the people who do actually migrate have a lot of agency and that agency needs to be recognized and protected. So staying with the example from Puerto Rico, I'm going to wrap up with a review of the data sources that were used to study migration from Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. I assembled this table listing each source of data as well as five characteristics on which they can be compared. The major difference is between the first four types of data listed above the black line and the last two types of data listed below. The first four types of data come from administrative records that record movement at specific time intervals. For example, geotagged tweets from Twitter measure current locations whenever an individual tweets. So you can tell if a person's moved from one location to another. IRS records um, also record residential addresses at the time of filing. And we can tell by comparing addresses from one year to the next whether a tax filer has moved or remained in the, at the same address. These changes in locations are what we count as migration, and they obviously occur at different time intervals. But these data are not representative of an entire population of a geographic area. They're selected by who is tweets, <laughs> by who files, files taxes. So, um, so that's one of the limitations. They also have few or no demographic measures. We don't know anything about tax filers from the data that's released in this um, IRS migration flows data set, except how many people, how many dependents are in the household and, um, and what their adjusted gross income is. However, this type of data from administrative records is available relatively quickly and can often be accessed for free or with low cost. The last two lines of data describe data from federal or specialized surveys. These are time intensive to collect and they uh, cost lots of money. They produce cross-sectional data for the American Community Survey, they're, they're reported annually. For a specialized survey that somebody might, like a, a researcher might carry out, they might only occur once or maybe twice, but it's hard to uh, collect longitudinal data that way. These survey data are rich in qualitative measures of individual and household characteristics, 
and they, if done correctly, are representative, representative of the population. They don't typically include narrative data about lived experiences. So that's a different level of qualitative data that is, would be even more difficult to collect at this scale. In these surveys, migration is measured retrospectively with a question about where a person lives currently and where they lived at some point in the past. Surveys are slow, so they're not going to be useful for tracking migration in real time, but they have the potential to tell a much richer story about who migrated, where they went, and the relative well being of migrants compared to non migrants. Survey data can be combined with remote sense data in a statistical framework to describe and sometimes even um, do a causal analysis of migration. So, you know, these are rich data that we use to do a lot of research, but they're not going to be timely. So the takeaway from this exercise is that there's a trade-off between the timeliness of data and the availability of qualitative measures. I'm gonna end here with one final thought to focus the work we're going to do today. This thought harkens back to the lesson that I learned from my experience as, her, as a Hurricane Katrina survivor and a scholar, as well as the extensive case study literature on forced migration. In disaster situations, residents have agency and want to make choices, even when migration seems to be the only option. A humanitarian response to forced migration is one that expands and enhances migration's options of when and where to go, how long to stay, and with whom they will migrate. I'll end things there. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth, for a really interesting talk that really gave us a lot of structure to start this discussion off. I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm going to ask the committee members and other panel members if they have any questions at this point. Is there anybody that has a, a question for Elizabeth at this, at this point? I'd like to ask a question if I could, Pat. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in the last line you said about uh, humanitarian responses to open options, opening options for migration and displacement. I was wondering if you could describe the type of data that would be useful for that. Hmm. Well, I think that um, the I've so that's the type. I, I don't think there's a single type of data that's useful for supporting that kind of assertion. Um, you know, I, I referred to a broad literature on, with case study research on, um, on lived experiences of forced migration. And I think that um, when you look at, say, people who have had uh, forced migration experiences where they end up in an internally displaced person's camp, where they have very limited uh, options and very little control over the circumstances of their lives, these are some of the most miserable places on earth. I mean, they're just, and, you know, that literature is, um, you know, it's out there. It's out there that these camps are very undesirable. Uh, in the United States, our disaster assistance programs are designed to enhance people's options for residential post-disaster residential mobility. And I've done, I've researched that kind of um, that data on that myself. We do, I have, I'm part of a project called the Resilience and Survivors of Katrina study that um, where we, did in-depth interviews as well as uh, survey research with a cohort of women living in New Orleans before Hurricane Katrina. And one of the things that we find is that there's a, the people who had longer displacement trajectories 
had disrupted lives for a longer period of time, whereas those people who were able to go home relatively quickly were able to recover and restore themselves to that pre-disaster condition much more quickly, and that was just simply better for people. So there's a lot of data that can bear on this question of what's the, what's the best kind of post-disaster migration outcome. Um, and I, it wouldn't be any single type of, micro, of, of data. But you, but you seem to be emphasizing quality of data interviews, things that get at this lived experience and these, these life courses that led to this, um, uh, this response to the disruption. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks, Harvey. Any other questions from the panel at this point? One of the audience members asked a question about spatial scale of analysis. And the question is, what higher level units of analysis might be used in migration studies? For climate change relocation, for example, might neighborhood level data or city level data be used? And would be, there be you know, different kinds of insights and advantages to aggregating up to that level? Yeah, um, I've used the IRS county to county migration flow data set to look at post Katrina residential mobility. And we have been able to show that, uh, you know, we've done a lot of research on what we're, what me and my colleagues call recovery migration that shows kind of the stage, the, the process through which people left New Orleans and then moved back to New Orleans in the subsequent years. And the reason why we can use county level data for that for that study is because um, the because Hurricane Katrina's destruction was so massive, and so it happened. You know, the entire parish of New Orleans, not the entire parish, but there was a mandatory evacuation for the entire parish, and eighty percent of the city was flooded, and so the displacement scale just for that single place was was massive and so and and it's also have, there were a lot of people living there so it was easy to use this data to trace migration patterns but most disasters have a smaller footprint than hurricane katrina they would occur at the sub county scale and they would affect fewer people. And so that approach, that spatial scale probably wouldn't work for something like a tornado. Um, so then you'd have to ideally have tract level data, uh, census tract level data, or some other kind of um, spatial scale that would be smaller and more appropriate to the, to the footprint of the hazard or the disaster. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I imagine there is some gap in the in the depth and the maturity of research on large scale disasters versus small spatial scale disasters. <clears throat> is that correct? Are are these uh, sort of small dispersed individual point disasters less understood and less known? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we have a total. There's a, a very big bias in social science research on disasters toward the big ones. You know, those are the ones that make the headlines that capture our attention and that produce enough sort of impact or statistical power that we can do a survey and actually expect to have some statistically significant results. Um, when and we don't know very much about the impact of smaller uh, disasters. My colleagues and I um, have also used county level population change data to look at the entire range of hurricane events in the United States and their impact on county level population change. And one of the things that we found that I think is super important to um, recognize is that most disasters our most hurricanes, let me, sorry, not, the, they're different. Not all hurricanes produce a disaster, but most hurricanes actually do not register any effect on the change and on the population size of the county. 
Um, in fact, most uh, when a when a hurricane does affect the size of a population of the, of a county, um, the effect tends to be to depress growth in counties that are growing. But most counties in the U.S. are rural counties that have stable or declining population sizes, and in those counties, you don't they they typically don't register a statistically significant effect. Uh, so it's really just um, the large growing counties that are most affected by a hurricane impact. And, uh, and so, and, and actually sometimes the effect is a little counterintuitive because after a hurricane, there's a huge infusion of, of recovery money. And sometimes that actually attracts people to a place so that in some instances, there's actually population growth after a hurricane, particularly if that place was already on an upward growth trajectory before the hurricane. Do you have any thoughts on what should be done to address this gap in understanding between large disasters and spatially smaller disasters? Do you have suggestions for kinds of research that should be started or or new data sets or techniques that should be used? Yeah, um, I do. This is uh, one of the one of the concerns that my colleagues uh, Jack DeWard and Catherine Curtis and I share. We have a research agenda around this um, where we're trying to assemble data on the entire you know, population of say hurricanes or tornadoes or floods and then map them onto population uh, with a spatially temporally harmonized longitudinal data set to understand how these statistical relationships look. The other, you know, that's that's a research agenda that we have underway. Um, unfortunately, we are constrained to the county scale because of the way population data and disaster data are organized. Um, so I think one innovation would be to figure out how to combine that data at a smaller spatial scale. I think Census Bureau would only release it at the, at the census tract level. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, we're somewhat constrained by, by that. But, um, but understanding the sort of generalizable effects in the US of, uh, of hazard events at whatever scale, um, and their effect on population change is one that that's definitely where we are right now, where we need to keep pushing. Um, the other thing I would add is that one of our findings that we haven't yet published from this research is that places are adapted to the hazards that they usually experience. So places that experience more hurricanes actually experience less population change after a hurricane. And places that experience, you know, no hurricanes, obviously they don't cause population change. It's the, it's that middle range when of places that ex infrequently experience a hurricane and therefore may not be well adapted to uh, to that hurricane, they're gonna experience more damage and more of the kind of displacement that happens um, because of the, when, when a hurricane is particularly destructive. So mm -hmm. I, that's another feature of places that needs to get incorporated into, into this sort of study. Not all places are not all equal in their ability to cope with, um, with these natural hazards. Yeah, and I suppose that idea could be translated to different types of disasters. So for example, this event that we're hearing about in Yellowstone National Park in the news today, maybe they'll label it a 100 year flood. I'm not sure if, if that's what they'll label it, but it seems to be a very unusual event for that location. And the big floods that really affect people's lives usually are quite rare. So there may be classes of disasters that 
are at one end of this scale and other kinds of disasters that are at the other end. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I think about it is that in the United States, we have for um, over a hundred years, the Army Corps of Engineers and localities have been um, hardening and managing the environment, hardening our infrastructure to mitigate hazard impacts. And those, those uh, in investments in protection have, they work, they really do work. And what we're experiencing right now with climate change is an increase in the number of extremely destructive events for which that infrastructure, those investments may not be prepared. It may be hitting the maximum um, capacity to withstand those types of increasingly frequent extreme events. And so we either need to continue adapting the, and improving that infrastructure, or we need to decide where we're gonna move people out of harm's way. And so this sort of, there's a national discussion about managed retreat and how that's gonna unfold. I think that my point about making sure that policies like managed retreat respect residents uh, agency and give them tools to make the, to, to do managed retreat on their own terms, as opposed to a top-down approach from the government is really important for avoiding a humanitarian crisis. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, that's where I think our conversation is right now, where a lot of people are, are increasingly using this word managed retreat to think about how we will cope with the increasingly hazardous future. And, um, and so, you know, kudos to you all for being, uh, for being forward thinking about how to, how to make sure that that we avoid these sort of human rights violations that, that you know, honestly, we've seen in, um, in the United States in the past, or mm -hmm. even right now, when you think yeah. about places like Ile de Jean Charles in Louisiana, you know, that has been an important object lesson in how to, um, I'm not gonna say it's been 100% successful, but it, there are a lot of lessons. Let me just put it this way. There are a lot of lessons to be learned from that particular mm. case. Great. There's a couple of other questions. I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but um, here's another one related to the data issue. Um, has there been any use of information from citizen science, uh, community-based science, do-it-yourself efforts, or contacts made through organizations such as co-op extension services, et cetera, that have been useful in understanding these issues? Hmm. Um, I can think of a few of those sorts of, you know, citizen science or do-it-yourself research projects that have been used to study disaster effects on communities. One of those effects being displacement or evacuation. Um, they are um, they are. I'm sorry. I, I can in, I can point you to that study uh, later. I'm not thinking the name of, mm -hmm. of the name of the author right now. But there was one that was done after Hurricane Katrina. There are actually several that were done after Hurricane Katrina. I think the issue is that, again, we that sort of data collection effort happens for the big events. And that when the, a small event occurs, we may not see the same kind of mobilization of resources to collect this kind of information. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, so much for that excellent opening discussion for the day. Now I'm going to hand the mic over to Mapping Sciences Committee member Kristen Kurland to moderate the first panel. Thank you very much, Pat. And again, thank you, Elizabeth. That was an excellent talk, and I learned a lot. 
Um, in our first session, we will hear from three speakers about using human-centric geographic data to map human movement and land use, and also design humanitarian response efforts. Each speaker is going to speak for about 15 minutes, and we'll hold questions from the committees and those of you listening throughout the webcast until we've heard from all the panelists. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, who is Anna Trianda Filiadu. She's a sociologist and mitigation policy expert at Toronto Metropolitan University. So take it away, Anna. Hello. Hello, everyone. Oh, yeah, I was about to say, okay, you have my PowerPoint, right? Okay, thank you all, and uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for a very... I mean, I, I have a few questions, but... Uh, I thought uh, perhaps some of them will be answered today as we as we all make our presentations. So, well, de delighted to join you. I'm joining from Toronto. That is the dish with the one spoon territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississauga tribes. And dish with one spoon is actually also very pertinent to our to our discussion today because the dish is, is our natural landscape, our natural resources, and we all have one spoon to sharing them both synchronically, uh, like the, the people who, who we are here today and we're all invited in peace to share, but also I feel that this is a diachronic message in terms of us having taken those resources from previous generations, since time immemorial and the indigenous peoples and, and having a responsibility to, to transmit them to the next generations and to keep them in, in good order. Um, and having said this, I just want to then uh, go back to my the, the main, um, how can I say, focus of my talk, which is how do we use data and actually how do we deal the, with the very um, extensive availability of data? And that's where, I mean, I, I like very much some of the things that, that Elizabeth said. And as I said, I, I have questions also in terms of who provides the data, who uses them, you know, the, and, and how do, you know, how do we incorporate them in our analysis? If we can go to the, the next slide, because I believe you have the control, right? I don't, yeah. So actually I wanna start by just showing a, a few slides about how we use migration data and what kind of data we have available and alert us to who creates those data. So this is an example of um, the data that we had from the so-called Balkan path in during the refugee uh, emergency in the Mediterranean and in Southeastern Europe and the whole of Europe in 2015-16. And I wanna just add a personal reflection as a researcher at the time, I was so delighted to have real time data. So you could go on that website, either of IOM or the UNHCR, and you could see every week how many uh, men, women, children, what nationalities were crossing, mainly through Greece, but also through Italy or, or Spain um, every day. And you could even sometimes actually trace where, where they were going. There was no effective you know, tracing in terms of following people, but you can see those graphs that were being produced. And I was also producing and reproducing them and using them in my own research. If we can go to the next slide. Um, that's part of the same, um, you know, actually an outgrowth of that initial coverage of uh, the 2015-16, you know, what I, call, I personally call it the refugee emergency generally has been known as the migration crisis. And that's also something to, to be debated, whose crisis, what crisis. But anyhow, I think that part of that and part of the uh, concern with uh, people losing their lives in, in crossing the Mediterranean um, gave birth to the Missing Migrants Project, which is an IOM project. Um, and here, for instance, you can see, I mean, this um, the screenshot is from um, a, a current, um, how can I say, da database being um, constructed in relation to displacement in Afghanistan. And I chose uh, specifically this uh, snapshot rather than the map that you will see uh, later on, on the Ukraine current. Uh, you know, displacement and refugee crisis. Because one would think, uh, you know, on one hand, you're thinking, oh, that, that is so wonderful. We know what is happening. But then you have to ask yourself, how do we know that? How can we know how many people were intercepted? How many people arrived um, in Europe? How many attempted crossings? How many deaths and disappearances? Um, so, so I think that is a very important point 
that like who is collecting this data, whose data are those, what do they show, and how do we use them? And if we can go to the next slide. Sorry, actually, I have sorry, I have to 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 correct myself. The previous slide was still on the Mediterranean crisis. I'm going I'm going to go back to the to the Afghanistan thing in a moment. So so but but my questions um, are, are still valid in terms of who collects them and how and how do we know. So and here you can also see obviously this this uh, big capacity of collecting data that we have is reflected currently on on the Ukraine and and you can see those data that you can access in real time and actually with this really nice visualization of you know where are the so obviously the big bubbles are the many uh, displaced and refugee people um, and you can also have this different uh, accounts so for instance refugees but also border crossing so at least there is now an awareness that it can be more border crossing than people because people can can cross more than once or different borders and if we can go to the next slide so um, and and here is yeah the this, uh, the the Afghanistan case, and I think I'll I'll I'll, I'll want to, to to spend a minute on this slide because this is the IOM displacement matrix. So basically, IOM has local people from their IOM branches in different border crossing points, and they collect the data of the people who are crossing. Now. We have with a, with a colleague of mine, Yunus Ahuga, who is studying more IOM and the global governance structures. So he was alerting me to the fact on how, you know, on how these data are collected. And there is apparently 200 people in Geneva who are processing this data, but we are still in the process. And I don't wanna say that uh, we're gonna find something, how can I say, irregular or unethical, but we're still in the process of digging to find out because my question to, to my colleague was immediately, under whose jurisdiction are they collecting this data? Do they have ethics? Um, and I'm not someone, you know, that is a big ethics bureaucrat, but suddenly I was thinking these data are collected from people in distress because they're crossing a border because they're fleeing. So these are uh, recent data on, on Afghanistan after, after August, 2021. So um, we're talking about borders that it's not like, um, you know, the, I don't know, the, the Spain, the Spain, France border at the Pyrenees uh, or not, not uh, the, the German, German Polish border, not the US Canada border. So these are borders that are probably in, in many places. Um, how can I say they're border areas rather than a very, you know, bureaucratic border of the kind we are imagining when we're crossing here from Canada to the US by car. Um, as I said, people are in distress. Um, IOM people who are collecting this data are probably, um, to the best of my knowledge, are collecting this data while they are also providing some information, or whether about support, whether about programs for repatriation or from further moving onwards. Um, and my question is the extent to which people are given an opportunity to say, no, I don't want to give my data. I don't want you to register me. Whether the support they're provided is conditioned upon this data. And actually this, um, uh, apparently this very systematic, this first systematic collection that is now expanding in different world regions uh, was something that was started after the Libya crisis nearly 10 years ago when actually IOM did certainly a very crucial thing because it was providing for support at the south, uh, at the southern border of Libya for uh, people from sub-Saharan African countries that were fleeing not only generalized violence and disorder in Libya, but also specifically racist violence against them. And there was an effort to try and, and help people to reach a safe haven and also repatriate to their the respective countries of origin. So, what I think I want to say is that data can be collected for, for positive reasons or for good reasons. And, and we know that actually uh, a big motivation behind collecting such data has been also when people are going towards refugee camps to provide information. You know, there is this population arriving. This population has children, has babies. You need to send milk. You need to send diapers. You need to send X amount of food. But the problem is that today with the technology that we have, 
this information travels very fast and can travel very far. And um, it is clear that often the people that provide them are people in distress and people who are not, um, even if they were told, you know, you have the, the, the possibility to refuse to, to give your data, maybe they actually don't have the responsibility, the, the, the possibility. And if we can go to the next slide. So this is my, 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 these are my question marks in terms of real data. And I wanna, again, emphasize that particularly when in 2015, 16, at least that was the first time I was aware that there was this possibility of having real-time data. And I've written a few papers on, on that refugee emergency. I thought it was so wonderful. And I was making arguments about, for instance, how the flows between spring and summer 2015 and early 2016 had changed in terms of their uh, nationality composition or their uh, gender composition or you know, children versus adults, et cetera. But then I started asking my, my, myself, um, even demystifying the very UNHCR and, and the kind of data they, they, they collect and what, for what reasons, but, but particularly the, also the IOM, the problem of being in a transnational actually jurisdiction, having no clear oversight. And of course, um, the idea that we need to, to, you know, to make sure that we're not even un, un, unwillingly and unwittingly take advantage of the fact that people are in a vulnerable situation. Um, and okay, there, I mean, again, I'm not one of these people that say, oh, we're benefiting it disproportionately as researchers because we're making our careers on this data. I, th I feel that I'm trying to use, it's a very political service in the wider sense, by making my, my you know, doing my analysis and trying to highlight some, some issues um, you know, and, and criticize policy and hopefully both shape public discourse and policy. But, but there are some very important issues because data, unlike in the past, unlike in the very recent past, can travel so quickly and, and so widely. And um, they can even, I mean, there is such a big emphasis on, on how we collect and use this data. And if we can go to the next slide. So, I want to I want to talk about then the no harm principle that certainly is very important and that's why I want to say this is something that we usually very much pay attention when we go out do qualitative interviews or you know ethnographic work field work um, um, and so on and there is in most universities by now um, you know actually very oftentimes very bureaucratic ethics procedure on how you ensure that you're, you're, you're respecting the vulnerability of people, giving informed consent. What does informed consent mean when people are not familiar, uh, you know, with the written page that they have to sign, they don't want to sign for many good reasons. And actually, I think it is, it's a very important point to, to, to ensure ethics, not as an administration thing, but as a very important um, uh, process that the that the research has to build, particularly with populations that are in conditions of vulnerability. Um, so I think there are two 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 things that I want to highlight. So one is usually the police is um, you know knows much more than the researchers about issues that relate to criminal activity and even irregular movements. Nonetheless. We need to be very, very careful. Again, it has to do with what kind of data and where do we store them. Um, I remember a few a few years back, I had a, a great, uh, you know, uh, collaborator uh, who who was working in on on uh, the Central American migrant caravans. That was, I think, in two thousand seventeen, and we were discussing, you know, how he would make sure that, you know, he wouldn't put into danger any of the people that he was traveling with because he was traveling doing ethnographic anthropological work as part of the caravan and how to ensure that he would transmit the, the data, uh, you know, to me and I would store it and he would delete from his phone and all these issues. So um, that was a very important thing. And, and, um, and I think it remains a process rather than, you know, a procedure that you take boxes. The other question that was pertaining to that research, but also many times my own, for instance, research on irregular migration um, in Europe was how do, when you publish your, your results, um, how do you make sure that the media coverage is fair, that your, your findings are not taken out of context and, and abused, and they don't contribute to the, 
you know, further securitization of, of migration and asylum seeking. And again, um, I have in mind one particular um, occasion that was again back at the time of the Libya crisis and intensive border crossings uh, through the Mediterranean. And I had given that interview to a journalist I trusted and I knew from a big uh, French newspaper. And everyone was asking at the time, because I think it was the time when Gaddafi had said, oh, there's millions here waiting to cross. And the Italian government was trying to, to you know, to, uh, how can I say, refute this argument. So he was asking, what do you think? And I was trying to explain that this uh, given numbers is a bad idea because I said, you know, no, not everyone wants to cross. You cannot know. And I was trying to explain also some things that I think Elizabeth was talking about, uh, how people make their decisions. And I said, you know, this, what they say about three, four million is totally out of proportion. Even if we tried to make a, an estimate and I was explaining past data and I said something about um, 300,000, I think it was. A, and I said, but I, I was trying to, to make sure that still this was not a number we could trust. And then next day, the title that his editor, as he explained to me, gave to the, 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 to the, to the, the article was 300,000 are expecting in Libya to cross to Italy. So, so this is something very, very important. And I think with real time data that we have, it is even more um, an acute danger. And here I'm not just talking about quantitative data that like I was illustrating a minute ago, but even qualitative data, because those all, these also travel. In the last two years, we've, won, we've all been interviewed many more times than in the past through Zoom interviews, uh, because even the nature of journalism is changing these days. Um, going to the next slide and to, towards the, you know, the conclusion of my talk, so I want to emphasize also in terms of the, the, the real time data and the, the way they travel, the risks for the researchers. Obviously, I think in, in the last few years, we've had a few, uh, how can I say, lessons learned about authoritarian regimes and police violence. I think after the Arab Spring in particular, I don't know how many people in, the, in this workshop are aware of the case of Giulio Regeni, a PhD student, Italian citizen studying um, at Cambridge, who uh, was actually killed by Egyptian police. He was doing research on trade unions in Egypt. And I, I think this has uh, sparkled the whole, um, you know, conversation and scrutiny that was already there, but a much at a much higher level of awareness about when, when um, researchers go in the field that there are important risks that need to be accounted. And, and particularly, and that, that is true also for um, uh, irregular migration, for instance, or, or asylum seeking. And again, thinking of my colleague that was in, in, um, in Central America with the caravan, um, we were really concerned. Um, of course, he, was an, he is an experienced researcher, but like, unfortunately, Mexican police are known not to treat very nicely um, people who come from Central America and you know, are crossing with the caravan. On the other hand, for instance, another issue that is that uh, merits um, attention is what do you do if you find out information that involves life-threatening risks? And again, for instance, what do you do if you uh, are doing research on migrant smuggling? Again, a field where I have done a lot of research in, in relation to the Mediterranean. And what if they tell you, you know, we're, we're having this boat tomorrow night, but it's not a seaworthy boat, but we get the money and, um, you know, we don't really care. So um, this is also an important conversation that we need to have. And again, particularly given the technological, you know, advance that we have and how quickly we can transfer information and what are, um, I mean, obviously the basic rule of thumb is you try, you, you tell people they shouldn't be telling you anything about criminal activities or illegal activities, strictly speaking. Um, but of course, if you, if you find out some information that involves a risk of death, you have to report to the relevant authorities. And going to the, to the next slide, so I'm trying to, to wrap up my, my discussion, I look also forward to, to hearing from, from the other panelists. So um, trying to, uh, kind of come with uh, some, you know, future directions. I think it's not that we're going to go back to not having data, not having them readily available or not transferring them. So certainly we have to, you know, make the most of the, the capacity that we have today, but also think of our ethical obligations. So I think big data and I think what um, 
again, we have seen, for instance, in relation to environmental displacement is we can try and model and discover new relations by bringing together different types of data that are available and they can be available from different sources. So not just population registers or, you know, data on, you know, temperatures or on, you know, level of sea rise or, or other environmental factors, but also data that would not have been thought as immediately relevant, like, you um, uh, we heard just before from uh, Elizabeth Fussell, like, um, you know, uh, social media data that are readily available and, and, and can be processed or, for instance, um, you know, cell phone data. So I think we need more robust self-regulation at that point, both in terms of the researchers, but also in terms of the organizations and of the journalists. And I think while regulation has to play a part, it's also important to develop our own ethical codes. I think self-regulation in these cases is oftentimes a very important aspect because as we have seen with social media, you can regulate to a certain extent, but um, what is more, more, more important, we have seen in particular with the very controversial cases of Facebook, that having your own ethical code is, is, is perhaps more far-reaching. Now, with regard to, to quantitative data and how do we bring them together with uh, big data? How do we explore the dynamics of mesa and micro factors? And I think these are very important data because um, you know, they, they help us make sense of connecting the dots or if we find some relations through a quantitative model, how do we then further elaborate and understand the process of decision-making? But it is important to always keep in mind that our research can make vulnerable people relive very traumatic situations. And it can also create false expectations. And I'm sure all the people who have done qualitative work in this room have been uh, with vulnerable populations have been in this um, situation where th even despite what you say that, you know, you cannot, you're not part of the decision makers, you cannot influence decisions. There will be hopes that you can speak about this particular person's case and perhaps help them say, get forward with their asylum application or solve any other issue. So um, I think there are some standard then challenges that remain that were there before the technology was more advanced, but there are also some new challenges that really pertain to the great technological tools that we have today. And I'd like to conclude with that and look forward to the, to the other presentations and the discussion. Thank you very much. Anna, thank you so much. That was terrific. And I and myself have a lot of questions, but I'm sure we'll be getting to that in the Q&A session. And you really set us up for what we're going to be looking at in our panels this afternoon, where we have a panel looking at the new technologies and the ethics and also mixed uh, methods for analysis. So thank you so much for, for that talk. Um, our next uh, speaker into this first panel is um, Lydia Andrews uh, from the Solder Collective. So uh, Lydia, I'm gonna have you take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am delighted to join you all from Sydney, Australia, where it's currently just after 3 a.m. <laughs> the next day, I'm calling you from the future. And uh, today I will be talking to you about co-designing alternative humanitarian futures. Um, so most of us who work in this space know that um, yeah, protracted conflicts and unprecedented climate disasters are pushing the humanitarian system. I'm talking about the international humanitarian architecture beyond its capacity. Um, and I'd like you to take a few seconds to think about your answer to this question that you see here. Um, just a moment of pause and dreaming. So how would you reimagine the future of humanitarian action? I'll just pause and give you a few seconds. All right. Um, I'm sure you could use with a bit more time, but other than daydreaming, um, what else we'll cover today um, in the next 15 minutes? Um, I'll share a little bit um, about what it means to take a design approach. Um, I, um, I'll i also share a bit about a project with the Humanitarian Policy Group, which is part of ODI, 
um, to reimagine humanitarian action taking a design approach. And lastly, I'll share with you where we we're at with implementing one of those ideas that were generated from this project. Um, and it really focused on changing the humanitarian system to be more accountable and adaptable. It's still early stages, um, but we can share where, where things are at. So first, uh, let's take a look at design and where it fits into the picture. Um, I think if we were in a room, I'd ask for a show of hands as to what, you know, who, who's worked with designers or worked on design projects, but let's, um, I'll just imagine. <laughs> um, so you've got here scientists here on the left side of the spectrum, also said to be more left brain, and tend to observe the facts of the material world with an emphasis on quantities. Um, humanities professionals are said to be more right brain and tend to observe the complexities of human experience with an emphasis on qualities. And so design as a third culture sits between the two poles of science and the humanities. And designers are said to engage in more integrative thinking. Um, we are generally trained to synthesize both human experience and the facts of the material world in order to imagine and create objects, interactions and value models that do not yet exist in the world. So given this, um, design's emphasis is on appropriateness and it gets to the heart of questions related to feasibility, viability and desirability when trying to create something new. So now that we've established where a design approach fits in, let's talk a little bit about what kinds of challenges a design approach can be applied to. So you can see here um, on the vertical axis, a sketch of, yeah, a, a graph. <laughs> and um, it's the degree of complexity and ambiguity of a challenge. And on the horizontal axis is the degree of participation required for, um, I guess, an optimal outcome um, in a change process. And um, you've got, yeah, this amazing um, professor, Richard Buchanan, who established the four orders of design to answer this question. And the first order of design is dealing with 2D visual communication challenges. The, th um, the second order is dealing with 3D objects and materials. Um, the third order is dealing with uh, like four dimensional interactions where time factors into the equation. So think things like user experience of apps, website and other services. And the fourth order of design deals with systems, so things like or, things like organizational strategies or social change. And this is the challenge space that I mainly operate in and will be sort of covering today. So when I talk about design, that's where, where we're headed. Um, also, just the last thing I'll sort of touch on regarding design um, is how it's different to perhaps conventional ways of working. Um, I guess designers, we, we deliberately design with the extremes in mind. Um, this usually means that we also capture the needs of all users in a curve um, to design sort of universally, as we say. Um, we also really place emphasis on understanding human experiences. There's this amazing quote, like, no one experiences the whole system, we experience pathways through it. Um, and so we dig into people's attitudes, their expectations, their behaviour, and this depth of understanding is what we use to then leverage um, nudges and interventions that speak to people's innermost drivers. Um, we also deliberately design in really highly collaborative ways. Um, we um, engage in extremely divergent thinking um, before we sort of converge um, and, and drive a bit of a testing mindset um, and, and we have a bias towards action, um, failing forward and iterating and to learn by doing. So that's sort of um, a really quick summary for people around what, you know, what design, what I mean by design when I'm going to talk, talk, talk about it. Um, so in 2017, I worked with the humanitarian policy group and a hundred other people to reimagine what the humanitarian system could look like for the future. And we, I guess, taking a co-design, a collaborative design approach on this project started with building a very shared understanding of the problem space and what needs to change. Um, 
you know, I'm not going to go through that with you. I'm sure you're all very familiar. Just to say, we, you know, we identified sort of um, these 10 key pathologies um, and that was achieved through 75 interviews with aid recipients and practitioners across 23 locations and 73 organisations around the world. Um, for each pathology, we then outlined, you know, key insights and opportunities. So, for example, that first line, you know, forgetting the human in humanitarian, um, you know, the insight behind that was that international actors are neither trained nor incentivized to be humble, to really listen and emphasize and empathize, I should say. Um, and that has led to poor relationships and distrust. And that the opportunity here is investing more in human to human relationships and trust building um, for connection. So that's sort of an example. Um, we also, um, to situate our design challenge, initially we mapped the broad actor groups and the functions and the relationships through this wheel visualization. You can see the broad actor groups um, in the slices, you know, people affected by crisis, government, multilaterals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I guess that didn't really do enough for us this kind of mapping um, from a from a design perspective we needed to sort of profile and personify the actors a bit more to be able to really get in their in their um, minds and hearts so you know using you know, we profile the actors based on composites of, of those interviews that we conducted um, here you see them situated across a two by two matrix um, it reveals the actors group the actor group's relative capacity to influence change in the humanitarian system at present as well as their relative degree of effectiveness effectiveness as it relates to crisis um, and so each each sort of, each sort of actor groups you know uh, presented um, with a bit more uh, detail which I, I won't go through today um, what we found though was personifying the actors helped the co-design teams um, to align and um, and sort of you know align on, on what's important rather than um, and on who's important and it helped to humanize the problems we we're trying to solve for rather than speaking about them in terms of statistics so um, that was sort of humanizing the actors we also well I guess in this photo you see on the wall there two out of 11 um, experience maps and they were based on human stories that were mapped very much in the first person and very much in verbatim form um, and these stories you know were then added annotated with barriers and enablers um, which were posted by the co-designers during the co-design workshops and these were used as sort of platforms for change um, yeah i guess what was most interesting i think some of these stories you can probably tell from their headings um, but yeah i guess you know where people had found workarounds improvisations and uh, unobvious ways to achieve their goals despite the current system and its pathologies rather than because of it and so once again they just really served as platforms for design inspiration um, I'm going to read this out. This is the future vision for people affected by crisis. Um, in a crisis that creates significant humanitarian needs, every person affected has access to basic services, safety and opportunity with the capacity to absorb shocks and the agency to shape her or his future. And then for the system, it was about a system that adapts to address the self-determined needs of people affected by crisis, is built upon recognising the agency of people communities and states and which can be held accountable to people for its failings. I know these it can fit neatly on a on a slide today, but that that was many, many hours of dialogue and debate and discussion. Um, we also talked a lot about um, this sort of, you know, ideal or preferred future experience pathway. And um, here, you know, you can see it, it lays out some of the basic sort of needs or desires of people affected by crisis um, and how they may be met through many various touch points by very many, many various channels. 
Um, so here it's about, you know, we have agency, we are resilient, we have protection, we have assistance, we have community, we have future, we are self-reliant, we have accountability. Um, nothing sort of surprising there, but it was sort of thinking about, you know, how would we then design those touch points that make these things possible, sort of shifting a little bit um, how we approach the action. Um, we also um, looked at the different roles. Um, I liked things that we sort of redefined here, um, talking about storytelling functions, talking about a multiplying function, um, linking traditional, non-traditional humanitarians, um, custodians um, to safeguard and, and, and quality assure what's happening. Um, so I think that was really powerful as well. Um, there were hundreds of ideas that were generated, um, but we did land on these 27 concepts um, that we developed in, in a lot more detail as well and sort of mapped them out um, and like sort of process map them and how, how they actually work in practice. Um, some of them, yeah, you've got, you can have a read, you know, failure targets, um, having like refugee charter cities, having um, plaintiff attorneys without borders, having, um, you know, intended obsolescence incentives, things like that. Um, we had yeah a community-led response fund where communities can manage and allocate their own funds. Um, Relief Watch, which you've got the loop sort of stamp on there because I'm going to speak to you about loop in a moment, um, was you know initially an idea about having an independent watchdog, which provides ratings of performance um, based on user and expert reviews for organisations, and um, United Beyond nations was interesting it was really sort of very anti-un in the in the dialogue and the debate um but it, it was sort of bypassing it to be honest people connecting directly with responders um, and service providers um, and identifying that what they need directly on a digital um, and networked humanitarian um, almost like a marketplace platform type thing so really interesting ideas um, so this brings me to the um, third part of what I'm going to speak to you today, um, and that's where are things at with implementing one of these ideas. And I say one, but it's really it's turned into something that's sort of borrowed bits and pieces. Um, so you, yeah, the humanitarian system does not listen to people in crisis. I think that we know that and feedback mechanisms and complaint, complaint lines are traditionally owned by the organisations that are providing the assistance. So usually donors um, are hearing and learning about the efficacy of programs they fund by our organisations who are delivering those programs. Um, and so Loop um, now exists and it is a safe and accessible platform for anybody to feedback on anything in any language without having to be asked. Um, that's that's its, its goal. So, of course, there are some brilliant m and &E mechanisms and reporting structures in place to gather feedback from recipients of aid, but um, as we know, they tend to go to the same old people who kind of give the kind of, you know, the feedback that organisations already know they're going to hear. And, uh, I guess we're le less likely to hear from more marginalised communities because of language or geographical barriers. So with Loop, um, the idea is that feedback from people, you, yeah, you can also get feedback from people who didn't receive the aid um, and should have or shouldn't have, <laughs> um, and giving them a chance to find out why they didn't receive the aid or if the aid that was given um, to their communities was in fact the aid that was most appropriate. Um, so it's based on some principles, you know, decentralization, open data, dialogue, um, being very proactive um, in terms of its accountability. Um, and, it, and it launched just last, last year <laughs> um, and is already operating in 14 languages across six countries. It's very much uh, locally governed and adapted to the local context through 
multiple channels, um, which you can see there, like, you know, channels that people already use, already have access to. So it's quite embedded that way. Um, I'll show you what you would see um, if, yeah, if you were someone who wanted to post a story using the web platform, um, for example. Um, and there's, there's also, you know, I remember some of the research also hearing that, um, that at, at anonymity, like some of these UN call centres don't really allow for anonymity because before you can give feedback, you've got to give all your details first. Um, so yeah, I think there were some really interesting design decisions made based on, based on the conversations um, and the research that was conducted. So also, you know, I'll let you have a very quick scan of, of one of these entries um, from earlier this week. Um, once received on the system, a story is tagged so it's searchable and replyable. Um, and if contact details are provided and a particular organisation is named, there's actually the opportunity for the story poster to receive a direct reply, which really um, closes that feedback loop. Um, you can also see here that there's a story type. So stories are tagged as either, you know, a thanks or a question or, um, yeah, an opinion, um, a request, a concern, etc. Um, and there's also a whole different process for sensitive stories where the platform helps people self safely manage and refer on issues such as sexual exploitation and abuse or protection or fraud and that kind of thing. Um, actually, a few months ago, <laughs> Loop received a complaint about a human trafficking ring that was operating outside of a town in Zambia and actually helped um, get it yeah, bust it basically. So I, I thought, yeah, that was quite an interesting sort of use case um, that, yeah, it's, there's some, there's real sort of a, a line of questioning for us around, you know, how do we sort of scale its use for, for those types of things as well. Um, there are sort of gone through the stories side of the platform. There's also the statistics side or more like analytics about those stories. So maybe as a donor, um, they may not have the, the bandwidth necessarily to interact with each story or piece of feedback, um, but they could have the bandwidth to see, okay, well, there's a lot of women in X province talking about shelter and sewerage after, you know, this storm or that um, event. And um, that's more of a high level sort of uh, way to interact with Loop um, and allows you know, donors and other decision makers to make macro decisions on how to allocate funds um, and strategies. While people who work in organisations um, in country can respond individually to people's needs as they're called on. Um, um, so, uh, last, lastly, I guess, um, um, these are the countries that it's currently uh, operating in. It is a decentralized model um, and, it, and it's very strong on having country-based governance and leadership and being hosted um, by a national you know, CSO. And it operates a bit like a charitable franchise concept. Um, and so, yeah, wherever it's hosted, I guess, is responsible to then, you know, train people and moderate the content in local languages and follow really uh, strict moder moderation protocols. Um, we are still a little bit away from the end goal of being a, a platform for anybody anywhere to be able to feedback on anything in any language. Um, but of what we you know what we do have is a platform where this is possible in Zambia the Philippines Indonesia and Somalia um, and regardless of whether people have an internet connection or not people can feedback anything in any of the, the languages that they speak in those countries um, some of these languages are also quite yeah underrepresented and marginalized in the humanitarian space so I think that's yeah, it's the first, yeah, first time for some of the languages to be digitised. Um, there's a lot more I could say, but I think we're probably um, close to time.
So I will leave it there and I look forward to the discussions afterwards. Thank you very much, Lydia, and nice work being done at 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, really interesting um, design aspects of all of this, and I'm uh, interested to hear some more in the conversation about uh, what you're doing. Um, but I'd like to move on to our final speaker in the first panel here, who is three hours behind Eastern Standard Time, uh, Steve DeRoy, who is the co-founder, director, and past president of the Firelight Group and founder of the annual Indigenous Mapping Workshop. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. And um, can what are you seeing my note slide or? Nope, we're seeing the slides. It looks great. It looks great. Okay, I just wanted to confirm. And uh, thank you very much. I'm really uh, uh, it's intimidating to hear uh, of such great speakers earlier on. So hopefully, I have something new to offer. And so thank you very much for your time and uh, and attention. My name is Steve DeRoy. I'm Anishinaabe from uh, a place called Ebb and Flow in Lake Manitoba First Nation. But I uh, call in from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation in North Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I'm going to be talking about Indigenous mapping today and how Indigenous mapping can be used to better understand issues around migration. And uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, I, I own a company called the Firelight Group, and we work for Indigenous uh, groups across the country by providing community-based research and support. And uh, the way we do that is we equip staff with the necessary, with the tools to be able to take on that work into the, into the future. And, and Firelight provides a whole range of services to Indigenous communities in Canada. Um, and so uh, this just gives a quick uh, overview of some of the work that we're involved in with Indigenous groups. And, uh, and this is just kind of showing where our work has brought us to across the country. So we're very fortunate to have uh, built these relationships across the country. Um, we're, by, because we're an Indigenous owned company and the way we do our work is we really focus on the things that matter most to Indigenous communities. And much of our work is designed to create and enhance community capacity and in a way that allow for Indigenous peoples to be in the driver's seat of most of the research that takes place. And so um, the way we do that is that we train Indigenous uh, peoples to actually carry out that research and be a part of the research team. And so we, and I'll talk a little bit later on about uh, how we do that training. And we have a pretty big workshop that we train people on how to do mapping. But um, uh, it, this, this kind of approach uh, permeates across all of our business areas and all of our work that we do. Um, so I love the idea of mapping. I'm a cartographer by trade. And so I love the idea of mapping and the power of maps. And uh, mapping has the ability to reinforce the relationship between space and place but that's rooted in symbolization, generalization, and, um, and uh, in classification. And, and for Indigenous peoples, maps have been used to assert power over territory. Uh, and, and the cartographer really holds a lot of power to decide what gets put onto the map and what gets consciously removed from the map. And Indigenous peoples have constantly been moved, um, removed from the map. And so although maps have played uh, an important role for communication and for navigation, the underlying notion of a map is, is that it's an exertion of power and knowledge. And so th those those cartographers uh, holding the pen wield the power to define place and space. And so, and we've seen that with Indigenous peoples over time that have been constantly uh, removed or displaced from the landscape to enable uh, a future settlement. And so, uh, so a lot of the work that I've been involved in is, is working with Indigenous peoples to use maps to decolonize and decolonize the map and, uh, and, and, and move towards uh, a new way of thinking, which is actually indigenizing the map. And so a lot of my work is uh, working with communities that are in the driver's seat, driving the process, deciding what gets put onto the map or what not get not to map. And maps are not necessarily new to indigenous peoples. We've been using them for generations to tell our stories and to assert our indigenous rights. <clears throat> 
And one of the earliest examples of maps that we've used are uh, star maps. And so uh, by knowing the placement of the stars, our ancestors could navigate to locations across the landscape and along the waterways. And then some communities, star knowledge has pa been passed down through generations and continue to be used today. And so maps, maps are just one tool in a toolbox to assert the rights and interests of Indigenous peoples. I just want to make sure that uh, we're not saying that this is the end all be all, uh, the mapping is the only thing, but you have to think about um, how else you might be able to tell that story. And so uh, for us, it's about uh, understanding what our rights are and understanding how we can apply them. And for, for Indigenous peoples, the burden of proving our rights is on us really like uh, we're not going to be relying on the governments or companies that are operating our backyards to ensure that our rights are acknowledged or enforced and it's important to understand the legal ramifications of where we're from and understanding what our rights are and understand how maps can be applied to ensure the rights of indigenous peoples are upheld and so um, as we've moved along in this storytelling uh, and, and data collection process, uh, we found that uh, the technology has advanced so quickly and, um, and, and the timelines for many of these decisions that are taking place on the landscape um, are happening at such a rapid pace. And so we uh, pioneered a directed digital mapping method and where we project Google Earth up onto the wall and participants uh, um, follow a, uh, a kind of a semi-structured uh, um, um, interview process. We record that and we record the map data and points. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how that looks uh, in a little bit. But uh, the idea that we could actually capture this information digitally and go through a, a major uh, research exercise to then uh, be able to uh, use that information to be able to analyze and tell a, a story of landscape and uh, migration. And so, um, so we're in this place of, of how do we uh, restory the map? And so for these next few slides, I'm gonna provide you a variety of ways in which indigenous mapping takes place. Just to give you some context, uh, the Canadian government established uh, the Indian Act in 1876, and that continues to this day. And, and there were, uh, it, the Indian Act was used to control most aspects of Indigenous people's lives, and it really focused on three main areas. It focused on band councils, reserves, and membership. And its primary purpose was to control Indigenous peoples and assimilate them into Canada. And so these points here on this slide really kind of talk about real elements of the Indian Act. And so, for example, and we worked with some communities that have a lot of the uh, for Indigenous groups that we work with, their lands have been expropriated for capital works projects such as agriculture, roads, railways and other public works. Um, and I worked with a community that had been relocated, not just for, like a few uh, blocks down the road, but like from municipalities and, and regions, like literally relocated from one municipality to another. And they've been relocated about four times in their history. And so this has uh, major psychosocial impacts on indigenous peoples. And so uh, be before we carry out our research and, and when we before we even go into a community to do this work, it's really important to understand this history so that we have a good solid understanding of, of, that, of the impacts that colonization has and continues to have on indigenous peoples to today. Um, and in many uh, parts of Canada, Indigenous peoples still rely on boat navigation to access parts of their territory. And boating is just one form of navigation that's used to be able to exercise uh, Indigenous rights. And so uh, other, other transportation modes include snowmobiles, vehicles, planes and helicopters, dog teams, walking through the bush. Um, so, but um, in some of these examples that I want to share, I, I think it's important to understand that uh, these waterways are important for migration and understanding migration. Um, so in 2011 and 12, I was doing a master's thesis where I was trying to understand uh, the connectivity of traditional land use values uh, of a First Nation in Northern Canada. 
And they had these this great information about where people hunt, fish, trap, collect resources out on the land. And, and it was pretty much a, a map of just a bunch of dots all over the all, all over the landscape. And what it, one of the one of the uh, issues that I had with this map is, is that it didn't connect the dots. It, we didn't we couldn't see the connections of these places. And so um, I built a, a network analysis to be able to uh, understand what those navigation routes could be. Uh, it was a multimodal uh, uh, model that um, that looked at how to how, how these places connected to their to their community. Uh, and then I, I went a further step to better understand, well, what happens if you have a certain uh, industrial development that falls within the territory, how much land could be affected and, and, and how much land could be alienated from a community uh, for them to be able to um, exercise their rights in their homelands. And so this really kind of um, set me up to better understand how we carry out the research in, with Indigenous groups. And so, um, so we. Well, th this is one of hundreds of studies that we've done. But I just wanted to use this as an example because it is in the public domain, and uh, it's one that I can share. And uh, it was with the Tlicho Nation up in the Northwest Territories. Uh, they had a proposed mine called the Fortune Minerals. Uh, it was a poly uh, metallic mine called the Nickel Project, and uh, they wanted to build this mine in the territory uh, near Tlicho. And so we carried out 31 mapping interviews with uh, community members from four of the Tlicho uh, communities. And we, and we're, we really tried to ensure that we followed uh, rigorous research methods. We obtained uh, uh, and implemented free prior and informed consent. Uh, our data, data um, uh, we, we, we're ensuring that, uh, that we were following OCAP principles for data, uh, meaning that uh, the data, um, I don't know if people understand what OCAP it is. It stands for ownership, control, access, and possession, and that uh, the information belongs to the indigenous group that we're working with. And so, um, so we tried to establish a, a strong data governance model for this for this project and all of our projects, where we use it to collect the information. But at the end of the study, there's a data repatriation process. Uh, that where we then give all the information back to the community and Firelight does not own this data. Um, the results of the of the mapping interviews highlighted some really key information about about how this mine might have an impact on the on the nation. Um, and and what we found was is that the main water transportation corridor is known as the EDOT Trail, and that there were multiple accounts of critical travel routes and critical modes of accessing those surrounding lands in those areas. Um, and and many many people were actually using those areas uh, for trapping, where they would you know follow these uh, trap lines uh, on a regular basis. And if this mine were to go through, it would actually affect those rights of the of the nation. And so this is one way that you can go through a, a research exercise to be able to capture this information and really understand how that migration can be affected uh, uh, by uh, by a proposed development. Um, we also carried out a study called As Long As the Rivers Flow, and it was with the uh, Athabasca Chippewan First Nation and the Miccosukee Cree First Nation in Northern Alberta. Uh, and it was based on uh, community uh, knowledge of the river. And um, what the end result was is that um, because the oil sands use a, a significant amount of water to basically separate the, the oil from the sand, they call it oil sands because it's like a, a sandy, oily kind of sludge, um, they have to boil it using, uh, for every one barrel of oil, they use about four barrels of water to be able to have that separation process. And so um, as a result, a lot of these oil sands projects were along the Athabasca River and just taking water out of the river uh, to be able to do this uh, 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 separation. And so what, what happened was is that because of that, the water levels were decreasing at such an uh, extreme rate. And, and this research that we carried out, uh, we were able to identify two, two elements. One is the Aboriginal base flow, um, uh, which identifies where treaty and Aboriginal rights, Aboriginal rights with regard to navigation, access, and water level might be practiced fully. And then the Aboriginal extreme flow, which identifies where flow levels are likely to result in widespread 
and extreme adverse effects on access to territories relied on for the practice of Ab Aboriginal treaty rights. And so we did this study with elders and knowledge holders uh, uh, from the two communities. And then in addition to that, the nation did their own independent studies where they were monitoring water levels of the river and, and looking at water quality and turbidity and a number of other issues. And, and basically after five years of collecting that scientific based monitoring, uh, basically the science confirmed what the elders had been saying five years earlier. So this is where we can start to think about merging uh, Western science with indigenous knowledge. Um, and so a lot of my work is, is looking at how we might remap the territory using an indigenous worldview and understanding of place as well. And so I, I carried out a place names mapping project with an indigenous group up in Northern Alberta or Northern Manitoba. And, and the whole idea was how do we reclaim sovereignty of the territory by remapping using indigenous worldviews and understandings of place. And so many of these places uh, uh, included rivers, navigational markers, landscape features, and we were able to get the Anishinaabe uh, name, the Slavics, and then the English translations. And this became a really important tool for this nation to, uh, to reassert their sovereignty to their territory. And, and um, one of the final examples I wanted to talk about uh, working with a group in Northern British Columbia where uh, they were, uh, there was a big proposed dam being uh, uh, built by BC Hydro um, where they were going to flood the, this entire Peace River Valley. And it was the third dam along the Peace River uh, and, and many of the First Nations, it, it was in their core territory where they hunt and fish and carry out their uh, rights. And uh, so we went through a ma massive research exercise to better understand that. But one of the elements of that, 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 we, that was an outcome of this is that we wanted to capture the natural beauty and essence of the Peace River Valley prior to it potentially becoming flooded uh, and being underwater. And so, uh, so we worked with Google and the Nunwadi Stewardship Society to um, basically mount a Google Street View camera onto a boat and navigate up and down the river to capture uh, imagery of the Peace River. So this was a really important exercise for the nation to better understand on the ground, what does it look like and how do, how do the nations identify to that? Um, one of the last examples I wanna talk about is really about how do we, uh, um, and I don't wanna say blend, I, I, I changed the word from blending to braiding, braiding indigenous knowledge and science on maps. And the idea is to create a multiple layer uh, atlas that can better understand those spatial relationships. Um, and the outcome of this work can really design a preferred future for the nation uh, that integrates both the indigenous knowledge as well as the scientific data. And, and one of the examples I've, I've been fortunate to be involved in was with a, 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 um, uh, a fellow named Doug Aberly, who was uh, kind of, he pioneered a method called bioregional atlas mapping. And so um, this, this mapping exercise resulted in a, a co-management agreement with BC Parks and the model is being applied in several other provincial park areas where indigenous groups have interests. And so this is the idea where we're moving beyond just looking at specific information, but how do we, how do we understand the spatial relationships and how things are related to each other? And so I think this is an important uh, element for many nations as they move forward. Um, but I'm, I'm noticing the time, the pace of technological developments is staggering and daunting. And for someone who's new to mapping, where can they get started? And we've really seen this transition from paper mapping to desktop community computing to mobile mapping to cloud-based GIS. And um, many nations, uh, uh, are, a lot of nations are doing mapping, but there's some that aren't. And so how do they get started? And so, um, so we've uh, um, started uh, in 2014, the Indigenous Mapping Workshop. And for far too long, Indigenous peoples have been excluded from the map. So we're trying to change that. And, and the way we're doing that is we're trying to build uh, spatial literacy in Indigenous communities by providing access to geospatial tools and culturally relevant training. And we've actually trained over 2,500 participants globally on how to use uh, geospatial tools. And we've had attendees from over 35 countries in all six continents. And so we're very fortunate to uh, have been able to uh, uh, build a global dialogue on indigenous mapping. <clears throat> 
And, and since 2014, the Indigenous Mapping Workout Workshop has been an Indigenous-led event, and it's focused on building a global community of Indigenous mappers. And so, um, so we're really, uh, these are some of the goals in which we're trying to achieve that, that, uh, that collective. And, um, and these are some of the places that we've done uh, our workshops. So since, since we began IMW, we've hosted a number of in-person events before the pandemic, both here in Canada, uh, as well as in Aotearoa uh, and Australia. And so we've uh, supported our Indigenous partners in those two places to launch those, those Indigenous mapping uh, workshops. And so um, we're really excited uh, uh, for our future events. Um, we do have one that's going to be coming up and that will be um, in Alberta in uh, November. So we're looking at hosting a workshop in Edmonton. So uh, look to indigenousmaps.com if you wanna learn more about this. Um, the other aspect of all this is that it's, uh, we've built this collective and, and since the pandemic, we had to move all of our training to an online space. And so, um, so it was created in 2020. We've had we have over uh, 1,500 members uh, on the on the collective, and uh, it's free for Indigenous peoples. Uh, if you're an academic or work for government or uh, work for industry, then um, we ask that you uh, pay a nominal fee to be able to access all of these training materials. And this enables us to be able to ensure that we can continue to offer it for free for Indigenous peoples. Um, we have over 150 sessions that are available on demand. We have over 100 hours of content that's been recorded and, and, and put on, uh, on the collective. And we have over 40 mapping trainers that are, are active in supporting uh, this global dialogue. So um, the idea is, is that we wanted to have a virtual platform that allowed Indigenous member, mappers to connect with each other and have premier access to mapping resources. And for the first time, mappers can revisit all the Indigenous mapping workshop content at their own pace. Um, I'm, I'm out of time, uh, and I just wanted to say, Chi Miigwech, thank you so much for your attention and for listening, and, uh, and, and I, I think we'll switch to... Uh, yep. to uh, thank um, you so much, yes. Steve. That, that's excellent. Um, you, you're doing really great work, and uh, thank you so much for all of the, the great information on how you're communicating and collecting this and, and mapping all of this information. Uh, thank you to all three of our panelists. Uh, Anna, um, uh, you know, you did a really interesting uh, talk about, give, you know, talking about real-time data ethics, how data travels so fast. Uh, Lydia bringing in the design aspects of this, uh, looking at loop and ways to have safe and accessible information. And then Steve also, you know, again, just uh, looking at integrating and braiding all of this. I like that term braiding instead of blending uh, this information with the historic um, stories that we have with your Indigenous population and then mapping that to make decisions. Um, I'd like to open now for the committee members who might have questions for our panelists. And for those of you in the uh, public audience, if you would put your questions into Slido, we can try and uh, uh, integrate all of this. We're gonna extend uh, just a little bit to about 2.05, so we do have some time for Q&A. So I'd like to just pause for a minute and see if we do have questions from any of the um, committee members. I, I have just a, a comment that I think uh, our, our three presentations are very nicely complementary because I think I tried to signal some of the potentials, but also the, the pitfalls, the, the, the problems of technologies. And I think what uh, Lydia and Steve, Steve have done is to show also the other, how do you use data? What are again, the, um, what are the new potentials, but also the limitations. And I think it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. And also the interface between, you know, the the subjects of the research, the researcher, uh, you know, and the outreach and, you know, the or if you want the loop back to the communities, it's fascinating. And yeah, yeah, lots of things to think about. Yeah. And one of the things that, you know, I was thinking about when you were talking about, you know, this information in these different jurisdictions of collecting this data, and in particular, when you said, you know, some of the support that are given to some refugees are depending on the data that they're giving back. And, you know, how do you trust that? It's almost with, you know, Lydia and Steve, you, you already have some of that trust within those populations. And so, you know, I th thought that was quite interesting when you start to look at, 
uh, you know, Lydia, especially the loop. I think that was very fascinating to say, okay, we have this in your, your language. We know it's accessible. We know it's safe. Whereas when you're in a condition that you described, Anna, where you're, you know, in a flux and, you know, how do we know who we can trust? I think that's, you know, quite interesting how you can set up those, um, I, I guess they're design ways or design communication ways to start to have trust into all of this. Um, I do want to take a pause. I'm not seeing questions, but we do have questions from the public. If, if you guys don't mind, I might jump into those and then committee members, we can jump back into your questions as well, because I don't see hands up right now. Um, so one of the questions we have from the public is, have there been any use of citizen science and community-based DYI efforts and, uh, and context? And I guess I think a little bit into that uh, talk about, again, you know, how do we get the community, um, you know, citizen science engagement in this? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? And I'm sure. Well, through the Indigenous Mapping Collective, the whole idea is, is that we have Indigenous peoples leading their own research and leading, designing their own uh, mapping approaches. And so it is uh, relying on elements of citizen science um, and, and by bringing people together and showing where you can access data, how you might be able to carry out your research with the methods uh, for various approaches to ma um, research. Uh, and here are some tools that you might be able to go out and do this. It's, it, it's definitely rooted in citizen science in, in a way that allow for Indigenous groups to start building their own maps and telling their own stories. Yeah, I think, I think it's very different if there, there is a community. So, so I think in, in yeah, again, I, I, I'm not sure, but for instance, in the case of um, in some um, in some of the work that you illustrate, Steve. Um, so, for instance, if if I think of how indigenous data were were collected, certainly the community existed, was there, but it wasn't. It didn't have the power, so it could not um, at the time. You know. Um, re react or, or or was very limited or suppressed, oppressed. Now, for instance, if we're talking about the population, so even thinking about environmental disaster, people fleeing or the cases where I was speaking, say Libya, you know, um, you know, being the, well, not dismantled, but really being in a lawless situation in the early 2010s and people leaving, these people cannot be conceptualized as the community because they were coming, I mean, they might or might not have been. So I think this is one element in terms of the agency of, of who is being studied and whose data are we using that, that is important. Uh, the other thing I want to say, I'm not saying, and I, as I said, in this particular case of the displacement matrix, we're looking into it and I wanna clarify, I'm not, um, as I said, we're, we're looking into it. It's, it's, it wasn't readily available. It wasn't easy to find. So, so we're digging deeper. But I want to say, so the, the question is, first of all, that if you're fleeing and, and there is someone providing for some support, you, you might not even think, should I give my data? Should I not give my data? You, you don't even have the luxury of thinking of that. Um, the next question that I think is, well, maybe that, that was done before, but it was done by paper and pencil, and it wasn't perfect as data. The problem now is the data travels so fast. Mm -hmm. I think this is both the big power and the big uh, liability in, in there. Yeah, Anna, you know, I couldn't help but think that uh, in your cases, you don't necessarily have the luxury to set up a design you know, process for all of this because you don't know who those populations might be. And um, so I think that that's, you know, that's, that's really interesting. And you're right, that data is, is collected and it does travel fast. Um, I see Pat has her hand up, Pat. Yeah, thank, thank all three of you for really interesting talks. <clears throat> I was really excited to hear about all of this ground up um, impacted people generated data becoming available in the, the clever and, and exciting ways that you found to, to get it and use it and evaluate it. And it made me think about the contrast between these ground up direct but more informal data sources versus what we've thought of as our formal data, you know, data generated by the government or the colonizers. And 
traditionally we've thought of those as two different data sources. And I wonder how much the ground up people originated kind of data that you all are talking about is being accepted by the official data sources. It, is it working? Do we really have communication between the official and quote, less official, but more original and grounded data sources? Or are the official data sources still resistant to, to looking at these other kinds of data? Have we gotten past that barrier? I can jump in here on, on the loop front. Um, we haven't passed that barrier and um, when I spoke, there's a there's another designer who leads Loop. Um, I, I sort of led the sort of strategic work, and he's more the sort of interaction design, um, the platform design. And um, I spoke to him two days ago, and he said it's still really cold out there. <laughs> um, and um, I think they were they had a meeting with some donors who are funding the platform i won't name who but um and also some sort of legacy multilaterals um and the donors had convened this meeting because the multilaterals um were really against uh loop sort of being developed and and sort of in, you know increasing its um its geographic scope and its language scope and they the the resistance the claimed resistance was based on security concerns um, and that's all been designed for to a T like it's been it's it's been done really really well um, and so that was you know explained um, in detail um, and there was still resistance um, so I think the donors now have sort of come back to people you know looking after loop saying it's clearly political people are th feeling threatened that their sort of business model um is under threat <laughs> and their sort of sense of place in the world is under threat um and so yeah i think it's i think it's a really important question i think when we were doing the research initially for loop like this you know the very very sort of early stage research um we had partnered with a um an organization i can't name either um that does a lot of survey work um and uh midway through our one year of prototyping they decided they didn't want to have anything to do with the project anymore um because it was too qualitative and we were you know we were putting too much faith into data that you know was kind of you know too it's, yeah, it didn't have integrity and um, and I, and I see that as an extremely colonial perspective that because, you know, you're white and you sit in <laughs> the global North, that the data that you make sense of, um, has value to you, but because it's someone else's data that that's not, um, you know, that doesn't, you know, fit that normal, you know, normal or, you know, traditional sort of, um, way of of you know the world views um that yeah I, I think you know what i'm trying to say it just yeah. doesn't fit so therefore it's invalid or it's not doesn't have integrity um so, so and, and so it was quite confrontational and, and challenging and so I, I don't think we're there yet there's still yeah. a lot of work to be done yeah work to be done yeah uh, marguerite do you have a question uh thank you yes um, my question is for um, Steve DeRoy, but it could be anybody. I was interested in generational differences of the acceptance of the technology and also maybe the trust or distrust of, of who's going to use the data, where is it going to do it, is it ultimately going to harm us? Um, Steve, do you have different versions of your workshop for maybe younger users or older, <laughs> elder users? Uh, that's a great question. And, and further to Pat's, uh, I was going to provide an, a somewhat of an answer. So I'm glad you've asked this question, Marguerite, because it kind of ex answers both. Um, uh, the idea of integrating and accepting the data, uh, I had a few points. One is that Indigenous groups have uh, been omitted from past data gathering efforts, and uh, it might have something to do with assimilation tactics of the government. Uh, two, uh, Indigenous uh, data gathered uh, is held closely to Indigenous groups, 
because uh, there's been a history of misinterpreting and misusing that information. Mm -hmm. And three, the methods for data collection have been court tested and peer reviewed by uh, lawyers and law firms across the country. So um, how we collect the data has been, uh, has been tested, but how that information gets shared is a different question and whether it gets integrated in national yeah. data sets, that, that likely won't happen. But to answer your question, Marguerite, about how, how the audience, um, we, we train everyone. And so we're very keen on trying to build uh, uh, spatial literacy across the board. And um, so we have people that are young people that are coming to the workshops. We have elders that are coming to the workshops. We have staff that are working for those nations. We have decision makers and leaders that are a part of that workshop. Um, and the idea is, is that we, we kind of design the workshop with um, two tiers in mind. We have people that are just coming into the industry that want to learn how they might be able to collect data, analyze it, and tell a story through a map. And then we have an advanced stream of people that are, have been doing this for years, and they're mm -hmm. looking for advanced methods and advanced approaches to how they might do mapping. And so we kind of think of those kind of, we don't think of it more on a, we, we don't want to be ageist in that sense, but we want to yeah. think about more of if you're a beginner, start here. If you're someone who's uh, been doing mapping for some time, you might want to start with these tools mm. there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you yeah, thank you. And, and, you know, Steve, you know, that's this whole thing with the community engagement and helping the, the populations to navigate. And I think that's one of the things that you do so well is helping them uh, navigate the government, um, you know, collaboration and intervention. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I, I do want to say that there were two other questions for us to maybe think about for uh, the panelists uh, coming up. And one is a question about the range of non-human data that can be used as proxies for the human movement. Um, you know, things like diapers or pet food and, you know, other, uh, other uh, supplies that people need as they're moving and that are not tracking the people themselves, but uh, the things that, that go with them. And, and I think that leads, uh, that uh, talks a little bit about what you had been talking about earlier. And then also what types of ethical oversight might uh, make sense for programmatic data collection. And again, this is, you know, um, human subjects research, data collection, and we're gonna be talking about a lot of that uh, in our next two uh, panels coming up. So with that, um, I thank you again. They were, as you said, Anna, you know, three diverse, very interesting talks. Uh, Lydia, you know, design thinking, I think it's so important and what you guys are doing and the Sonder Collective um, and engaging the citizens from, you know, uh, many different uh, countries. And Steve, your focus on the indigenous population um, is terrific. So we're gonna take a quick break. Um, you now have 12 minutes instead of 15 minutes to maybe answer one last email on the break. And uh, we'll be coming back at 2.15 when we have our second panel, which is new technologies for tracking human movement and the ethics of using them. So with that, we'll take a quick break. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome back to our workshop. Um, we are heading into panel two. My name is Budu Bhaduri and I am a member of the Geographical Sciences Committee. Um, on the panel two, new technologies for tracking human movement and ethics for using them. Uh, we will hear from three very exciting speakers about new technologies on tracking human movement and the ethical concerns uh, that we have associated with using those technologies. Each speaker is going to speak for about 15 minutes and we will hold questions from the committees and those of you listening in through the webcast until we have heard from all the panelists. With that, our first speaker is Dr. Miguel Roman, who is a senior director and chief scientist at Lidos. So Miguel, the stage is yours now. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from the East Coast. Uh, I would like to start uh, by talking about uh, and presenting a you know, a couple of things, a human ecosystem and satellite-based perspective on migration and display, displacements. I, um, I, I enjoyed our pre-meeting with Budu a few days ago, which some of you may not know, but we're, the academy is very organized. We have pre-meetings. And I was going to do my classical NASA scientist spiel about how wonderful satellites are for fixing everything. You know, because technology like satellites, they're a panacea. They're the solution to everybody's problems. 
But I think I owe it to Voodoo and the team of the academies to actually think more critically about technology. And so I'm going to uh, try to uh, play multiple hats here. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, not just as, uh, as, as an individual that grew in Puerto Rico, uh, who has Dominican blood in his brain, in, 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 his, in his veins, uh, someone that grew up uh, dancing merengue uh, and salsa, and someone who used to uh, sing to the tune of uh, Juan Luis Guerra in Cuatro Cuarenta. Uh, there's this beautiful song called Visa para un sueño. Visa for a dream, and I'm trying to translate uh, uh, Guerra's um, you know, music, um, which hits into some of the notes uh, of why our Dominican brothers and sister, uh, sisters have gone through the struggle and the you know, often um, violent struggle to pass through the Monas Passage and become members of, productive members of Puerto Rican society. Um, and so I also wanna, so, so I wanna hopefully tell you that story, talked about some frameworks, talked about some data and then we'll end and hopefully uh, go back to uh, from where we started. Um, I really enjoyed today's keynote and I think hopefully this will build upon uh, the existing frameworks and understanding of displacement, uh, particularly as we think about the use of technology uh, and society and nature as central to our helping understand uh, displacement and migration. Uh, so let's begin with nature. Uh, next, um, a lot of people may have already seen this picture of the 2017 hurricane season. And we all have lived experiences around particular events that change our lives and change our professional mindset around the issue of migration, development, you name it. And my, my case is Hurricane Maria, and hopefully our keynote speaker already discussed beautifully the implications for, for today's discussion. I wanna add a little bit more color uh, to my experience. And I think in spite of it being a little bit repetitive, it's important as I tell my students that we have a critical view and learn the important lessons of previous events, no matter how traumatic or painful that may be. And so let's start a little bit to talk about Hurricane Maria in terms of the causes of displacement. If you go next, here are some numbers. Uh, these numbers are very inconsistent from study to study. Um, some um, estimates talk about 100,000 uh, persons displaced, some of others over 200,000. Uh, same thing with mortality rates, excess mortality. The numbers go from 30 official numbers to 4,000. Uh, as uh, statistically driven numbers uh, from the Institute of uh, Statistics in Puerto Rico. Uh, that was the Kilshaw paper. Uh, but what, is, what I care about is what is the unknown, which is the emotional impact uh, that Hurricane Maria had um, on the lives of uh, those uh, living in Puerto Rico, who are not just only Puerto Ricans, but also include uh, many members of our Caribbean diaspora, Dominicans, um, and not only Dominicans, but also the refugees that we took in prior to Hurricane Maria when Hurricane Irma destroyed Barbuda and we had to evacuate 2,000 people uh, to receive emergency medical assistance in Puerto Rico. And then Hurricane Maria uh, um, impacted the island. I'm gonna go and present a framework that hopefully provides some clarity in the importance of integrating technology humanity and society. Um, and hopefully this framework uh, can be used and operationalized in a data-driven perspective. And I'll introduce only one data set uh, that can help us get further in that discussion. All right, so I'll go next. Uh, we already talked about the issue of, of livelihoods. Um, in a matter of hours, the entire agricultural community of Puerto Rico collapsed after years and years of developing uh, cells of uh, development of agriculture in Puerto Rico. Uh, so that's one key sector and cost of displacements. Next, the other one is mobility. Uh, this is the, the bridge from the town of Utuado. Over eight, about 800 families live on the other side of this bridge and had to wait six months for the federal government uh, to provide an emergency bridge and assistance relating to a complete collapse and of, you know, that is directly lead, 
between remoteness and, and the issue of displacement. And finally, uh, I wanna talk about legacy conditions. So the next slide, this is a picture taken two weeks ago. Uh, there are over 3,500 occupied housing units in Puerto Rico that still have blue tars instead of roofs to, um, to protect shelters of families. And they have been recent close calls with other severe events like Dorian that have already exposed how ill prepared the island is to withstand additional storms. And so um, all this is um, allows us to then frame uh, the importance of today's discussion around the quality of interventions. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the Roundtable on, on Sustainability and Natural Economy. So sustainability is something that I care a lot about. Uh, so the next slide and I'll- Recording slide, in progress. Is the issue of, of the quality of interventions. On, on the left, you see um, the uh, emergency uh, food supplies that were provided by the federal government across rural communities in Puerto Rico. And I'm gonna just quickly read through this because every, every time I see this picture, I event. Um, since Hurricane Maria, nearly half of all citizens of Puerto Rico are suffering from hunger, um, and partly because of the recurrent acute disaster of COVID, uh, which merits its own roundtable, shipping delays have increased the amount of time food imports arrive on the island. Uh, the shelf stable meals that you see on the right uh, included baby roofs, airheads, and expired cheese and crackers. Not to be surprised from a country that classifies ketchup and French fries as fresh vegetables. Uh, the one on the right uh, was provided by local NGOs and communities uh, that were displaced within the San Juan metro area, many of them Dominican uh, immigrant communities. Uh, they included uh, you know, very comforting food and brands like adobo boillo, arroz rico, a dozen eggs, pasta imported from the US mainland and locally sourced canned meats and shell stable milk cartons. One of the unintended legacy, positive legacy conditions of Hurricane Maria is that it is, it is making people think how we feed our people that are displaced. Um, the World Center Kitchen, uh, which is widely known for uh, their intervention across major conflict areas, started um, its work in Puerto Rico after Maria. Uh, we just had a discussion with them uh, two weeks ago at the academies. All right, so all these, that's a big mess, right? We have an issue of displacement that is tied to key sectors. And these sectors are tied to a larger human ecosystem model uh, that we are now presenting um, and recently published. So if you go on the next slide uh, with members of the academies and those who have looked at this from an ecological systems perspective. Um, and so this is the work that uh, we introduced. It's called Recurring Acute Disasters. And it uses uh, the work of uh, Bill Birch, Gary Macklis, and Joel Enforce, the human ecosystem model, which has been tested um, in crisis settings, including the deep water horizon oil spill and Hurricane Sandy. So if you go next, let's talk a little, a little bit uh, about the Birch model. A good example of what we're talking about today is the interactions of multiple systems. We look, we look about flows of individuals from one place to the next. And I think we need to start thinking more in terms of what these individuals provide in that as they flow from one human system to the next. For example, in Puerto Rico, we only, the only, there are only two remaining brain surgeons in the whole island. And so, and that is a service provided to the entire Eastern Caribbean basin. You need to come in and be dropped up by helicopter if you're suffering from a brain aneurysm. Same thing with ventricular diseases, same thing with oncological diseases for pediatric cancer. And so when we think about displacement, we need to think about the brain drain that oftentimes uh, uh, afflict people in terms of duration, uh, because it's, it's, it's a generational brain there. I, I am, you know, I am a member of the Puerto Rican diaspora in the DC area, so I can tell this uh, out of personal experience. But there's also, as we talked about in the previous session, a flow of information, a flow of capital um, that it also needs to be tied into the flow of people. 
And all this needs to be rethought about in the context of a changing climate where we're seeing the increase in recurrence, frequency, periodicity, and the expansiveness of new disasters. I, I was thinking about, you know, I, I joined at, at 12 p.m. So I was, I was listening and I thought, wow, when we talked about force or planned retreat, can we really think about force and planned retreat under a changing climate? Because people are just gonna be jumping around from one place to the next. Puerto Ricans moving from, you know, Dominicans moving to Puerto Rico and then moving because of Maria to Miami, which is over coming through sea level rise. So where they end up, they end up in Texas where they get, you know, um, freeze, freezing uh, that led to a lot of people to be coming at risk as well. There is no corner in this place that's not at risk in our planet. And so, so that, that freaks me out. And so I, I think about one particular measure that I think that is central to understanding this displacement. And I want to only focus on one, electricity. And so if, if you go next, electricity is so central to the livelihood and well-being of a society. Those that are displaced require electricity oftentimes if they are more vulnerable, either because they have need access to refrigeration for their insulin, or they need access to, you know, under a changing planet air conditioning equipment so that they're not exposed to heat waves. It is the one aspect that I think we can treat it as a keystone species in the same way we do it, you know, with human ecology. If you remove this function, this basic function, then sustainability collapses and human suffering accelerates. And so if you go next, what we look into is, okay, solutions. So now, now I do my pitch. So satellites. So we have Earth at Night technology that we've been developing for 12 years and it's not perfect, but it gives us at least a proxy of human conditions from space systematically in near real time at a sufficiently spatial resolution, even finer than track level, so that we can start piecing the human ecosystem together with other sources of data. And so if you go next, um, here's some examples of one, two, three, four, five, six examples of how near real time satellite derived nighttime lights from polar orbiting systems can be used to look at the causes and risks of displacement. We can start with Aleppo, after the Battle of Aleppo, the entire destruction of the city, we can see the flow of refugees into the El Zatari camp in Jordan. And so people leave one place and add to the other. We're just looking at the lights at 1.30 a.m. in the morning, however. So we're tying to tying an infrastructural service to human population. And we need to be very careful on how we do that. COVID-19 lockdowns, large scale um, migration that is being led by job by jobs that are going away in places like Dubai. Uh, obviously, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, uh, San Juan is used as a standard for comparing the rest of the island. Um, so there's always a means for us to anchor nighttime lights against other places. Um, this one's interesting, Venezuela, and the collapse of uh, the Bolivar when uh, there was hyperinflation in 2015. You can see this slow onset migration across all of South America, um, and in that scene in the light. And then traditionally you get seasonal migrations too uh, because people move, because they're looking for work and their goal where there's a lot of work. All right, so we go next. Let's go back to Puerto Rico. This is social media data. Uh, I wanna acknowledge the authors of this paper, uh, Acosta and Mirizaje, who are well known at looking at uh, really fine resolution, modernized measurements of you know, where, where are people at an in a given point in time? And I want to put attention to uh, the blue change, the rapid change of 75% in the mountain coffee region of Puerto Rico in the bottom. And then let's compare that. This is the important thing about the data scientists, harmonization and cross validation of measurements. So we compare this against the lights. Next, we can start looking at fine, spatial the disaggregation at 30 meter resolution within three hours. So this, this data, we didn't stop measuring this after, after 30 days after Hurricane Maria, we are still measuring this to this day. And so how does that look? If you go and look at the municipality level um, and you can cross compare the results next, 
Uh, you can start looking at urban areas comparing to rural areas, confirming uh, the results from Facebook that tells that rural communities are disproportionately displaced and more affected because of this key relationship to this keystone factor, electricity. Um, I asked my mother who stayed with us here in Puerto Rico when she was displayed, when do you wanna come back? And every one of those 100,000 or 200,000 displaced refugees said the same thing, hasta que llegue la luz, until the power is back. And so we need to start looking more broadly at technology and the technological failures that oftentimes are the result of a centralized system of response and inefficiency when rural communities require more informal assessments of risk in a displacement context. Um, I will end by introducing one dilemma to today's panel, if you go next. And it's the dilemma that we're seeing a density vulnerability trade-off uh, when it comes to, um, when, when we start accounting about changing urban patterns that are gonna be happening 10, 20, 50 years from now. And the dilemma is that who lives where can in turn shape the inequalities that we see in forced displacement. And, and so, you know, as, as we, we've seen that, uh, we see that in China, we see that in many places where we really need to pay uh, this really important attention at the issue of scale, uh, because ultimately where you live ultimately affects the outcome uh, from, from, a, uh, from a migration context. All right, so I'll end it with um, a few points. Uh, just reiterating the fact next that you know, we need to extend analysis, not replace, extend and bring up, bring to further analysis of population dynamics to assess the sustainability of societies and the sustainability of our biosphere to be able to withstand to recurring events so that we can live <laughs> in this planet. Uh, we need to look at keystone variables, not just energy, but also food and water, access to water. Um, we need to start thinking about the issue of frequency. And I think what we're proposing is the characterization of legacy conditions. This is very important because what happened after Hurricane Katrina absolutely changed the entire outcome and behavior of future disasters. And we need to get better at characterizing that. We need to get better at developing data and tools that measure legacy conditions. And finally, scales of big importance, but but you know, it's, it has to be driven by important societal need. And we need to include uh, the forgotten to advance sustainability. Sustainability for the sake of it, you know, doesn't help us. We need to be very targeted about that. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, that was a fascinating presentation. I appreciate you taking the time and sharing your personal story as well. Um, our second speaker is Kaske Tuholsky from Columbia University. Um, he is a postdoctoral research scientist at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network at Columbia. Um, Kaske, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm just uh, honored to be here to present today, and you know, uh, Miguel's presentation got me thinking. I'm um, uh, I'm a Montanan and I uh, was reading the climate impact assessment for the greater Yellowstone region uh, over the weekend before the flash floods uh, hit. Could we go to my first slide, please? Um, my title slide, thank you. Uh, before the flash floods hit uh, Montana this week and um, they don't mention flash floods as a climate risk for Montana and so Miguel's presentation really made me start thinking about just unanticipated risks and how both on the human socioeconomic side, but also the climate side, how we incorporate that into our decision-making frameworks. Um, and really to this point about legacy um, of these disaster events, and especially the ones that we don't anticipate happening um, in places like Montana with flash floods that wipe out whole communities. So anyways, um, I will be speaking today on understanding grid population data sets to measure demographic processes 
and hazardous exposures worldwide. Next slide, please. And my talk is really um, centered on some top-down kind of blunt instrument data sets that are increasingly uh, being used. And I'm gonna go into them in detail. And uh, grid population data sets, I think are really, really important. And I, if you take one thing away from my talk is it's just important to understand which grid data population data set you use and in what context, um, because you'll see that they can provide very different information. And that information can have real world outcomes, especially when we're looking at uh, disaster response and um, trying to anticipate the movement of people over space and time. So um, to, to bring some context into it, um, you know, for much of the planet, we lack really fine grained historical longitudinal data um, on human population. Um, so this is a great paper, the uh, figure right here from WaterUp et al. 2018, that's from PNAS. And they, just systematically lay out, you know, which country has had a census and when, and how publicly available is that uh, data. And you can see for many of the most populated places on the planet, we really don't have publicly available high resolution uh, census data. On top of that, um, United Nations population data estimates and urbanization rates can be inaccurate, um, often because they lack good underlying uh, census data. Furthermore, refugee camps and population data often are not provided or included in censuses. This is especially important for IDPs or internally displaced uh, persons. And so using traditional data sets like censuses uh, can be challenging if we want to understand the movement of people across the planet. Next slide, please. So um, this is just a very brief overview of grid population data sets. Uh, various teams around the world uh, have started to augment um, census data with remote sense information to create a uniform surface across the surface of the planet where each grid cell has people in it. So there's two, generally two broad monitoring uh, approaches. There's a bottom up and a top down. The bottom up approach is uh, to take a micro census or area where we have really good census data um, or survey data, and then build some spatial weights with earth observation data, and then use an algorithm to go out and tessellate the population throughout areas where we lack good information. The top um, down approach is the inverse of that. So we take the coarsest gray or the finest resolution census boundaries we have, and then use satellite and sometimes GIS data to say, here's where we think people are, let's allocate the census data into those grid cells. Um, and there's, I think four or five, or maybe up to six or seven different teams who have built different uh, grid population data sets and different modeling approaches. Next slide, please. The difficulty here is deciding which grid and population data set to use in what context. So the figure here um, is a map of Nepal. And here we brought in five uh, one kilometer resolution grid and population data sets. And we just said for a given pixel, which grid and population data set says there is at least one person in them. And so you'll see the dark blue areas are areas of agreement across the data sets, um, whereas the, the light green areas, you know, only one or two of the good population data sets really says, hey, there are people in these places. Um, and so, again, from a very decisionary making framework uh, in a hazard context or displacement um, situation, depending on the data set being fed into the decision making framework, you can have different results. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to present a few uh, case studies. Uh, right here is the 2015 uh, earthquake from Nepal. The primary, the epicenter of the quake was really just north uh, and northwest of Kathmandu. Officially, two million people were displaced. Um, uh, next slide, please. But if you look at here, we're not measuring actual displacement, but just uh, exposure using these gridded population data sets that using this uh, extreme event as uh, kind of a case study to understand how these products differ, you'll see a difference of 1 million people estimated exposed to an intensity of, uh, this is an intensity scale greater than seven. So really, um, the other thing that stands out to me is whether in 
uh, a population to decide is a rural impact or a broadly broad brush urban impact. And so for really data sparse regions that are exposed to uh, both climate and natural hazards or a complex situation, uh, these again, these data sets are really important, but they will provide different information. Next slide, please. And so in this, this paper, we walk through a couple of different hazards and also into some anticipation action um, frameworks as well. And we show is a similar finding. And the important thing I want everyone to take away from this is that there's not necessarily a right data set, but rather, um, especially those like me who are scientists need to be clear that it's hard to quantify the uncertainty behind these products. And that there are some products, um, you know, they're depending on how these graded population data sets are modeled. It's uh, there's some clarity as to which data set you should be using um, in which uh, use case, and I'll get to that at the end of my uh, talk. Next slide, please. So the same issue exists when we look at urbanization rates. So this was um, a project I led as a graduate student where we were trying to understand uh, urbanization for very broad brush urbanization rates using graded population data sets across the continent of Africa. And the first thing we noticed is uh, just even the urban boundaries, if you're just using raw density thresholds, uh, vary across these products. Um, sometimes it has to do with the satellite data that is fed into them. Um, sometimes it has to do with uh, different census units being used to create the data set or when the census was taken. Um, but this makes it really challenging to measure um, flows of people um, using graded population data sets over time uh, from rural areas into urban areas if you have this kind of uh, discrepancy. Um, again, these products are not necessarily do not necessarily provide uncertainty estimates or confidence, although uh, the, since this paper has come out, those groups are starting to produce that auxiliary data for decision makers. Next slide, please. And so this is some more recent work by uh, my colleague Dana Thompson, where she and her colleagues decided to do small area estimates of slum or deprived or deprivation areas or low income areas of uh, several large African cities. And they showed that almost uniformly, all of these gridded population data sets really undercount the number of people uh, officially living into uh, in low income areas. I believe this is from um, the figure right here is from uh, Lagos. And you can see that as these high, higher resolution products keep come out, that are usually satellite drive, you know, down to 10 meters, and they're estimating how many people live in a 10 meter grid cell, that even those products don't necessarily reflect the situation on the ground. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end, but I'm really worried that we're kind of trading accuracy for precision as we try to zoom in deeper and deeper without any sort of bottom-up uh, information to validate how many people are in a given area, much less where those people go uh, under a forced migrations uh, scenario. Um, and this is especially important when we're using building footprints as a proxy for people, again, at these really small, uh, fine-grained processes within, say, an urban area or a refugee camp. Next slide, please. So this is some work um, my colleague Jamin Vandenhoek is leading um, at Oregon State University to assess, again, these greater population data sets for, refu for refugee camps. And the first big takeaway from this is with official refugee camp locations often are not within um, 10 kilometers of any identifiable, like visually identifiable settlement um, from, from satellite imagery. So if we're feeding that information into a complex, you know, satellite coupled survey system, um, that underlying training data may be highly inaccurate and we might be dumping people into places where they're not, or more importantly, ident not identifying people who need to be uh, counted uh, in these scenarios. Next slide, please. So this is all to, again, I use graded population data sets in my research. I think they serve a really important function for uh, measuring human movement across the planet over space and time. And they're increasingly being used in climate projections. So this is the World Bank's groundswell report. Um, the baseline data in this report are calibrated with an initial condition in 2010, um, both from a population grid cell population side, uh, gridded population standpoint, 
as well as things like crop information and baseline climatic conditions. And then basically climate change just push through those grid cells and then a gravity model uh, distributes rural populations towards urban uh, areas. Next slide, please. And with this, they come up with a likelihood of climate in migration across uh, the different, uh, I believe this was uh, based on the CMIT-5 models, uh, but it might be CMIT-6. And they estimate across six major world regions the uh, flow of about uh, 200 million people displaced because of climate change into urban areas. Or the caveat is that, you know, the in initial gridded population data set they use is just a single one that, as I've said, differs from some of the other ones. And as Miguel kind of alluded to, they're under the assumption of a rural to urban migration framework, but that doesn't really account for people bouncing around um, or, you know, urban to rural migration, urban to urban migration patterns that these really acute climatic events may lead to the greatest uh, movement of people very rapidly. And then those people move to an area that's climate vulnerable and then they get hit with another climate event. So I think really distilling out, you know, slow onset versus acute um, and just rec recognizing that, that at the end of the day, we may not have all the information that we would like to have and being really forthright with, you know, what can we actually glean um, in a chaotic and compoundingly complex uh, world we're living in. Next slide, please. So just some quick key takeaways and I'll pass it off. If you wanna learn more, I really suggest um, going to this website, www.popgrid.org. There's an interact interactive feature where you can look at different grid cells for different areas. It also just provides uh, updated information on the different grid and population products as they're uh, produced. Again, I think these products are extremely important, but the caveats um, of the uncertainty needs to be conveyed. Um, the easiest way to do that is just to read up on the given product that you're going to use. Um, and again, with these increasingly high resolution products, we need to understand we may be trading off, you know, this better precision for uh, lower accuracy information and whether that actually aids us in making better decision. I think. We'll have to figure that out. Um, and then the last thing in terms of human population movement from my own research is that uh, clouds are always a conundrum when we're using earth observational data to measure human processes. So especially in the tropics, in terms of real time information, we might not always have that uh, even as these uh, modeling frameworks get better. So thank you so much for your time, really appreciate it. Thank you, Casca. That was wonderful. That was terrific. I'm sure that um, a lot of people are, are uh, you know, eager to ask questions. But before we get to the QA session, um, let me introduce our third and last speaker of this panel, Caleb Litaru, uh, representing the GDEL project. So, Caleb, uh, it's the stage is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, can we get my slides up? Well, while the slides get loaded, uh, so I'm Kavli Taru. Um, so the, the the vision really of the GDELT project is essentially this, you know, this essentially this this dream of scooping up the world's information. Uh, and uh, there we go. All right. Thank you. Perfect. So the vision of the GDELT project is really this idea of scooping up the world's information um, and trying to catalog global events in real time. And GDELT today actually powers a large fraction of of actually of actually a very, very large fraction of all global risk work done globally, either directly um, through GDELT uh, data sets itself or indirectly through all of the myriad risk data sets around the world that consume GDELT today. Uh, next slide. So the idea of GDELT is really about how do we take news and other open information and transform it into data that allows us to really understand the world around us, especially essentially taking, if you think about news and all this other news, academic literature, social media, et cetera, is designed for human consumption. Uh, it's it's uh, the spoken word, it's imagery, it's moving imagery, it's text. But at the end of the day, it's not codified. It was never intended for machine consumption. So how do we use machines to process that information, make it codified, but then how do we develop these analytic workflows that allow us to really start understanding the world from it? Next slide. 
Um, so it all starts with news, and this is actually a map of a couple of months of all the locations that GDALT has gathered uh, news from or about, and you can see it pretty much it matches global population, that essentially where people live on Earth uh, we're gathering information from. And this is very unique, because GDALT today, uh, we have an enormous emphasis on local media, print broadcast web, um, in local, local um, sources. So this differs, you know, if you think about political science and the social sciences, uh, you know, for the longest time it was, if it's not in the New York Times, it didn't happen. And still today, so, so much of that, of the work is done in English or a handful of European languages and Western sources. In fact, one of the major uh, counterterrorism data or one of the major academic terrorism data sets uh, that has sort of become the standard and used heavily by government, which also is oftentimes used to understand kind of migration flows around that, um, is based almost exclusively on English language American news outlets, um, which, you know, again, really kind of shapes your, really blinds you essentially to what's happening around the world. Next slide. Uh, so in the aftermath of the 2004 and Ebola, or sorry, 2014 Ebola outbreak, we looked back and we actually discovered we had actually seen the earliest of glimmers of that through local radio broadcasts in Guinea. Um, unfortunately, it was in French. The time period, we were only translating a fraction of that. So by the end of 2014, uh, we launched this mass machine translation infrastructure. So you can imagine GDL today, we're scooping up print broadcast web and broadcast of both radio and television uh, from around the world. Uh, we're, we're scooping all that in. We monitor today over 150 languages. We know we actually monitor more, uh, but language detection tools kind of break down once you pass 150, and we're actually about to launch a 400 language detector for that. We live translate absolutely everything we monitor in 65 of those languages, soon to be more than 100, which allows us to reach really, really locally. And so in the aftermath of the Ebola outbreak, we launched this translation infrastructure. Fast forward to 10 p.m. Eastern time, December 30th, 2019. Uh, we picked up uh, the, a surge of local Chinese language coverage in Wuhan, China, about a SARS-like viral pneumonia of unknown origin. The following morning, a company in Canada called Blue Dot uh, Global, which uh, the biosurveillance firm, um, that uses our data. They have these machine learning models built in our data. They sent out a worldwide alert, one of the very first worldwide alerts saying, based on this data and based on these other models, we expect a global pandemic will be coming by next month. And of course, uh, you know, so it was, it's a really powerful kind of statement about why it's so, so important. If we want to understand the world to monitor local sources and local languages. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also have academic literature as part of this, so a collaboration with the U.S. Army a few years ago. Uh, we want to, we, we basically from JSTOR looked at all the academic literature they've collected on Africa and Middle East. Um, we looked at, so if you're familiar with DTIC, uh, so U.S. government unclassed and declassed output, um, and then a lot of other uh, sources there to look at context. And, and through this, we actually codify out of, so you can imagine taking all this literature and, and extracting out computationally topics, geographies, bibliographics, all kinds of metadata. So you can go in and you can say, um, what are the food insecurity, take the food insecurity issues between these two groups that tend to involve mass migration events, and who are sort of the academic uh, experts that tend to be cited the most in that specific area, um, and how is that changing over time? So this is actually deployed as a production tool, um, was, this, was, was the development of this really so that idea of, let's say that we're going and we're actually trying to intervene, who are kind of those, those find experts globally, but more importantly, you can start looking at comparisons of what is the government and academic institutions like the National Academies, where are they focusing versus what's the reality on the ground? And there's a, a huge piece that, a huge paper came behind that, where we actually showed this immense, immense gulf between what academia and the scientific institutions like NAS study, uh, which tends to be where sort of funding priorities, it, it really has to do with Western policy um, and sort of the, the funding uh, sort of funding trends at the moment, instead of reality of where, where are events actually occurring on Earth. And typically what we find is the academic environment um, and the policy community is about 10 years behind reality. So this is huge, huge implications that we try to understand events at the ground. Next slide. Um, so you can imagine, you know, we're scooping up all this information from, from around the world. Um, you know, what can you do with that? So um, with respect to the area of migration, now again, GDAL is deployed in, in any topic on Earth, there, there's, there's GDAL is deployed in some way, shape, or form. But looking specifically at migration, um, typically one major use case is now casting and forecasting. So trying to understand global risk. So trying to understand, uh, you know, where might, uh, you know, where might instability come out? Um, how might that manifest? To what degree might migration uh, play a role or be an outcome of that? 
and where might uh, where might those patterns go? What are the stressors that they involve, that they might cause as they migrate, and that might affect their own migration patterns? And most specifically, how are societies likely to react to that? So, looking at sort of the the global risk environment uh, with respect to this, and that can be sudden exogenous shock. So that can be things like even natural disasters. Um, you know, say an earthquake, which might not be immediately predictable. You can, however, develop these forecasting models for if that does occur. What are the likely outcomes within the structures of this particular society. Next slide. Um, and more specifically, so this is actually a fascinating model that, ESA, that ESA, EASO uh, has come up with, which looks specifically at risk forecasting uh, for actually forced migration itself. Uh, so a lot of sort of specialty migration uh, models and specific models around the specific risk factors, whether that's food and water access and so on. Next slide. Um, but of course, once migration occurs, like once an event begins occurring, um, GDO is oftentimes used to map that in real time. So there's actually a fascinating map that BBVA came up with uh, during the 2015 uh, uh, exodus. And what's fascinating about this is, if you actually drill and actually matched, um, it actually matched eventually, government statistics sort of caught up, uh, because again, government statistics are so, so slow. Um, and so what this provided was a real time look at where flows were occurring, sort of inflows and outflows uh, local stories and specifically local reaction to that. That, for example, a small town somewhere, uh, a group of refugees showed up. How are they reacting to that? And how is that reaction changing? Because again, if we look at, say, the Ukraine crisis right now, um, you know, looking at, say, local Polish newspapers gives you a lot of interesting insights to kind of those early tail warnings of sort of the, the European reaction to that. Next slide. And we can also look at the mapping of narratives. So narratives, again, one of the most important things if we think about things like forced migration, um, it's not, you know, satellites will tell you where people are moving. Uh, things like CDR records, uh, so cell phone data records, will allow mass scale mobility um, at an aggregate scale. And those are, of course, deployed by almost all NGOs and governments today. Um, but that gives you certain things. And, and CDR records are, are very, there's a lot of nuance when you look at, at refugee migration, specifically around um, certain, you know, their, their applications in different parts of the world, different types of uh, migration patterns. But most importantly, what they tell you is kind of where people are at this moment. What they don't tell you is the most important thing, which is what is the information flows that are reaching migrants, uh, which has an immense impact on dis and misinformation uh, that can feed them. So both real information, but also, again, there are a lot of actors, um, both well-meaning, but also malicious actors, whether private sector or state, uh, or criminal enterprises as well, that attempt to direct uh, migrants, that attempt to use them uh, increasingly as a tool of conflict. Um, so feeding them, force, forcibly feeding them false, knowingly false information um, with this intent to create disruption. They're sort of becoming a form of irregular warfare in many areas of the world. And so how do we understand what are those information streams that are arriving to them? But then most importantly, the domestic reaction societies. And one of the things I'll show in a moment um, is how those play. And, and one of the things you can see with this is mapping narratives. So this ability to go through, and this particular example is actually drawn from climate change, um, which of course has a lot of impact on migration. Um, but that ability to, so this particular example here was, let's take a, a collection of, of a few months of climate change coverage, just take all the people that are mentioned in public news coverage and map the interconnections of those. And what you see in all those communities around those are the narrative communities, how climate change is specifically being internalized. Um, and around the periphery of those are the reporters, the journalists, the, the experts in those areas. So this becomes a very powerful way to take these massive, complex, and very fluid narrative environments, and begin visualizing them in ways that we can, that we can actually message into. Uh, next slide. But also understanding how the media is covering it. So this is uh, this is a kind of a, a global look at um, uh, coverage, essentially, of refugees, attention to refugees since 2017. You can see the Ukraine crisis caused this immense, intense uh, coverage of, ref of refugees and migration. Um, but we can see how quickly, almost immediately, within days of the war beginning, it faded away and it's continued to decline. Um, but also we can see Afghanistan didn't really cause nearly that amount. So we can see the world's attention and in return funding and policy and other support um, tends to flow, of course, through the pattern of, um, you know, what sort of the, what societies, um, specifically the large donor societies kind of care about in the world, which has huge implications there. Uh, next slide. We can also see that media attention to this, national attention to refugees and migration tends to peak with their own impact. So this was a fascinating uh, chart that Irwin did in 2015, and they looked at each country, when did they begin, their domestic press, begin talking about migration. And so you can see each country, um, as, as migration as migration flows spread across Europe, um, countries didn't say, oh, look at what's happening, we need to start talking about this. 
it wasn't until it reached their doorstep. We said, well, that's not our problem. It's someone else's problem. It's only when they reached their own doorstep that the media started covering that. And that means that that critical missing period, we can start preparing a population, discussing uh, what's occurring here, uh, the needs of these populations, all that messaging environment that's lacking. So it's sort of the average, the average citizen doesn't even realize that there's a crisis until all of a sudden it's on their doorstep and they don't really have a chance to kind of internalize or adapt. And, and that can oftentimes um, see the sort of a negative reaction to refugee flows. And so there's a lot of sort of missed opportunities there. Next slide. Um, but then also understanding how they're framed. So what you're seeing in this map here is when you look at media coverage of refugees, what are the countries that are mentioned together? Um, and so again, this is not the reality. This is how the world's media kind of views refugee movements across the world. There's a lot, and again, a lot of this makes sense. But there's a lot of telling insights there um, in terms of how we kind of the lenses and specifically the Western lens through which migration is viewed throughout the world. Next slide. Um, and also, the, this is a, an interesting one. So this is actually specifically of natural disasters. Um, so this is looking at the media coverage of a natural disaster and specifically the essentially the exponential decay curve of coverage. So you can imagine um, of a particular area, there's very low coverage and natural disaster occurs. It's a surge in coverage, lasts 72 hours and the decay um, is almost a perfect uh, decay up to 14 days. Now, what's interesting about this graph is, of course, media scholars have, have always known this, but what's fascinating about this is we can observe stories that deviate from this. So we can take any emerging story, overlay it onto this, and deviations show it's inorganic, that, it, that an, an external actor is inorganically shaping the narrative of that story, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's refugees, whether it's another story. That has huge implications. That tells us that this is no longer an actual story about refugees. This is something else entirely. Um, so it means that some other actor is attempting to shape this, whether that's as a tool of conflict to sow discord um, or so on. And that once you see those kind of deviations, that allows your analysts then to really drill and understand what is the messaging environment around this and what are what are the things that we need to do to intervene potentially. Next slide. Um, now, this map, this is actually part of an animation, which I, I, I'm not showing here, but this is actually fascinating. So this is scooping up each day, all take every mention of Paris across the world's media that we monitor each day, how positive and negative was all the coverage of Paris yesterday. If you do that across the world, um, what you get is, of course, not how happy or sad people are within an area, but how the world's portraying that. Now, what's fascinating about that is when we looked at Europe and we zoomed in, you can see the, the you can see positivity and you can see these tendrils of intense negativity start making their way through Europe. That was the backlash to the 2015 refugee exodus. And you could see that you could actually see in real time sort of this wave of positivity and then this turning against it as those refugees became sort of the, the outlet, essentially the scapegoat for anything that was that was happening in society, inflation, crime, et cetera. Suddenly it's all their fault. And so you can see that um, remotely through the data. Next slide. Um, and we can also look at things globally. So this is actually a fascinating one of sort of global positivity and negativity of worldwide media uh, since 1979, print broadcast web, over 100 languages. And what we can see is, you look here, and you look at the era of the web, you can see the web that sort of tone kind of moved around, but it was the web era as online news uh, flourished that we've plunged um, ever more steadily towards negativity. And that has a lot to do with media and how, you know, papers and, and outlets now are competing globally and social media and virility. But what it means at the end of the day is, as Steven Pinker actually used this, this graph in his book, I mean, if you, look, if you look more into this, you see that the world isn't necessarily becoming a more negative place, but the media is portraying it that way as they, you know, due to commercial pressure. And what that means is the lens through which we see, like the, the, the lens through which we see, say, migration is no longer going to be as it might have been 30 or 40 years ago. Here, these are real life human beings. They're migrating. Here's their challenges. Here's what they need. Instead, now it becomes an opportunity for essentially negativity of here's another bad story. Um, and, and again, that back, that sort of that backdrop of negativity more broadly. And this has, again, more implications to that information environment. Next slide. Um, we can look at simple things like pronouns within media coverage, and we can start looking at are, the, are refugees portrayed as us, you know, as, as, as human beings like we are, or is it those and they and them? You can see these fracture points in the media at key points. Next slide. Um, we can look at morality call out. So we can look at how, how are they being portrayed? Are they being portrayed as, um, you know, are they, um, is this a, a moral imperative to address them? Is it a patriotic duty? Is it a selfish duty to assist them? Um, what are their driving factors? And again, these are not the reality, but this is how it's portrayed to societies, which again has immense impact um, to the sustainment of policy uh, and, and the, the, the facilitation of resources. Next slide.
Um, and we can see this very clearly in things like Ebola. Um, when the Ebola outbreak occurred, it got very little coverage until the first Americans got it. And if you look at the bottom graph there, you can see that the tone of, of media coverage of COVID is very negative until the first Americans got it. And it became more and more and more positive. Um, and that, again, that was the, the sort of the Westernist savior that, oh, don't worry, now that Westerners, uh, Americans have it, we're going to go and save the world now. And that, again, has a huge implication to the lenses to which societies and in turn policy decisions of funding, resources, um, you know, all these different uh, factors play a huge role through that lens. Next slide. We can also see the impact to its major events. Um, so, for example, after after Curdie's death, um, you can see the tone of media coverage towards refugees is very negative. After his death, we saw this wave of sympathy there. Um, then that, of course, faded away. So the ability to kind of measure that in real time of, of, of these events. Next slide. Um, and this is a fascinating visualization uh, that Kenneth Davis did, was this kind of looking at media coverage of refugees and putting a dot in the map when there was a positive mention there. Um, so how are refugees being portrayed? Next slide. Um, this was another fascinating researcher. Um, and, and what she did was a really, really fascinating map is she took this media, because she basically um, took our live feed and looked for any mention of refugees are, and then looked at what came after that. So what is a refugee? Is it uh, is a refugee is a bad person? Is it a stateless person? Is it someone that's that's suffering? Is it someone that's cre that's a criminal? How is it being described and how does that vary across the world? Next slide. Um, so she created these these fascinating maps to kind of show uh, the main, you know, are they communities? You know, are they claimants? Are they basically a burden to society? Or are they part of our community there? Next slide. And she did these, these really fascinating maps where you can kind of see word by word by word, how are they described? And so understanding those narratives in real time. Uh, next slide. And then finally looking at, um, so this is actually, this is specifically about COVID, but this ability to create these large narrative maps. So this was actually an example done with COVID where the question was, um, it was essentially a, a group of, of allied governments where we know the major narratives around COVID. What are all the narratives that are coming out that we don't know right now? So the ability to sort of map those out in real time. Next slide. Um, and then finally looking at, so this was actually the, the map of COVID actually, as it first occurred, as the earliest glimmers um, reached our data sets, um, this was actually those early, early glimmers. You can see that first initial pickup, um, that's when we saw it. That final wave there was two weeks later when the rest of the world finally started coming to terms that maybe there's a problem here. So again, that importance of looking locally. Next slide. Um, and so finally, if you think about the GDO project, it's really this idea of scooping up the world's information, trying to process what's happening there. And specifically with respect to, um, to migration, it's really about this idea of understanding the world's risk factors, of seeing both what might be happening here, uh, but then eventually, you know, sort of looking at both what are the immediate risk factors, but then other things like exhaustion and shocks, what are potential scenarios there? As things come to a head, measuring that in real time um, and giving sort of those, those predictions, those, those essentially those forecasts, once things actually turn to action and, and, and events begin to occur, mapping those in real time, as those turn eventually into migration, mapping those out, and then as those, as those exoduses occur, how are, what is the information uh, environment that's reaching refugees? What is the information environment that's reaching societies? And how are they internalizing that? So thank you very much. I know I've covered a huge amount of ground here, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a glimpse of, again, this, this broader idea of how we can use these non-traditional data sets to both understand global events, both long-term, um, but then also, again, that narrative environment, which because at the end of the day, you can use a satellite to watch, uh, to watch migration flows. Um, you can use CDRs, observational data, all kinds of different um, data to kind of say, well, look, here are where people are. But without understanding the narrative environment around that, you can't really understand how societies are going to react. And most importantly, what is the sustainment and the range of policy options that are available? Obviously, in Ukraine, governments around the world are stepping up in a way that Afghanistan, they did not. Um, and that has a lot to do with, again, how it's being framed, how societies are being told these stories. Um, and so, again, that, the, the huge amounts of insights that, we, that can be gained from that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Caleb. That was fascinating. Um, I want to thank our three speakers, Miguel, Cascade, and Caleb, uh, for your fascinating um, presentations and insights. Um, you know, uh, Miguel did a fantastic job of laying out the background and some of the things that are associated. Um, some of the things that stuck with me are these uh, issues around food and nutrition for IDPs, um, and then the connection, the whole connection to sustainability of, of nations and states. Um, Cascade's presentation on you know, measuring um, population, especially you know, dis impacted and potentially displaced populations, from disasters using different kinds of data, you know, gridded population data.
Um, that was really um, very informative. Um, I particularly liked the issue about um, uh, the community's trend of uh, trying to be qualitative with building footprints. And, and he very rightfully pointed out that there is an issue about building volume, which we still do not understand very well. And Caleb's um, uh, real um, insights from how do you turn news into data and this qualitative assessments of the narratives that are not only allows us to understand broad general patterns of uh, you know, IDP movements, but also um, the sentiments around those populations and, and the population surrounding them. So uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for questions from the committee members. Um, and if you have one, please um, raise your hand in Zoom um, if you would like to ask a question. Uh, for those who are our public attendees watching the webcast, uh, please contribute your ideas into Slido and we will work to bring those into our conversations. Um, so let me go and see who would like to ask a question. Harvey. Okay, um, thank you very much for very interesting presentations. I mean, just really, I have, I have lots of questions, but I guess I have one underlying and I think very important question. So you talked, to, the panelists talked a lot about um, non-traditional data sources to get at things that are difficult to measure. Um, but when we make legal and policy decisions in government, we have really strict standards for data authoritativeness, you know, for validity, reliability, how representative the data are, how transparent the data generation process is, how accountable it is. I wonder if the panelists could comment on that. How do we take these non-traditional data sources and make them good enough for, you know, authoritative enough that we can make, um, you know, policy, legal, and, and infrastructure investment decisions. Who wants to take that one? I mean, I, I can start. I mean, you know, in the open source within, say, the, the allied governments, open source intelligence has an 80-year history of driving policy decisions. Um, you know, the, the original warning of Pearl Harbor came from open sources. Um, it was actually uh, Phibis's or FBMS's very first report. Um, so there's a, long, there's a long heritage and a long history there of trying to understand media narratives, trying to understand these types of open sources and understand that exact question. How do we translate that to policy? How do we understand the biases, the, the various pieces that play into that? So the short answer is there's a long, long history. What we've lacked is the tools and technology to focus globally um, strategically rather than merely tactical of kind of the, 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 the issue of the moment. So Ari, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I agree. There is a policy resistance towards um, sources. Um, but I also think broadly, if you think about policy, I think about like, I will put, put emergency and risk management in that, in that box. And let me tell you, if, if you give FEMA 60% accurate thing, they'll take it because they don't have anything else. And so there's, there's some of that going on in the pipeline. We as humans hate uncertainty and don't like to make decisions about uncertainty. But guess what? That's the future. The future is full of uncertainty. And so we need to be more a scientist and, and more open to talk about error bounds and data quality and traceability and all these other principles that would allow policymakers to understand that we've done our work to give you the best information that we can. But forecasting is, is as good as the data that we have. And so here are some investments that you can make if you want to improve the confidence of these predictions. For example, nighttime nights, everybody's asleep at 1.30 a.m. in the morning. So guess what? Half of Africa, all these maps that you see of nighttime nights, they're not that really useful because electricity decisions are being made such that, you know, turning off the lights to, you know, maintain energy storage. And so we need to think more broadly as a science community of what investments we can make to have, to have more optimal global remote sensing portfolios that are in service to the humanitarian community 
I'm hopeful that, you know, this group would help advance those causes so that we can tackle the issue of uncertainty. But, you know, trash in, trash out. If you're not going to, you need to spend in make investments and fund research on frameworks that allowed you to reduce those uncertainties. If, there, if you don't do that, you're not gonna get good policy outcomes. So it's up to the, us to communicate that to the policymakers. Yeah, I'll just add, I, I mean, uh, Miguel, you, you said very closely to what I was gonna say, and I, I can't recall if I said this during my talk, because my brain's a little fuzzy these days with Zoom, but, Invest in traditional, I mean, on the demography side of thing, invest in the demi traditional demography methods. We have to invest in our censuses. We have to invest in having people on the ground and understanding um, individual communities on a very human level. And I, I love remote sensing and I use it all the time in my research. But as Miguel said very well, garbage in, garbage out. And, and I really worry with machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence becoming where I see funding going everywhere, that those models are only going to be as good as your training data. And if your training data on the human side of things isn't valid, then your model's not going to give you the information you want. So traditional investment in real social sciences, I think is really important as we build out these technologies. All right, let's see if anybody has uh, another question um, while people are making up their mind. I wanted to ask one question, which is, you know, in our title of our panel, we use the word ethics. And um, as we, as you all discuss the different kinds of uh, measurements and analysis techniques for data, um, I wanted to ask all of you, um, your perspectives on you know, how ethics should be playing a role. And, and I can see this with, with one observation, which is um, the, the work that I am involved with you know, for many years is you know, identifying human settlements on, uh, from satellite images. Um, you can pick up these refugees and IDPs in very sensitive conflict zones. And that data being, if it becomes public becomes incredibly dangerous because you are putting human lives at stake of where people are taking refuge. Um, so it became an ethical de you know, debate about you know, what is the right thing to do? You know, do you release those kinds of data sets for public good or is it something that we should protect? So um, I'll, I'll open it up to the three of you to see you know, from your perspective, um, how would you characterize the, the role of ethics? I mean, from a media perspective, that's one of the nice things about looking at, at, at news media is, again, that, that openness there. Um, I will say that, you know, certainly with CDRs and, and social media data, you know, I've, you know, in past life wrote extensively on the data ethics area. Um, and, you know, it is one of those scary places where, you know, Facebook, for example, has this disaster mapping program. It makes it available. Um, but there's a huge amount of concern there because a lot of NGOs, um, you know, even major NGOs like the UN, um, you know, there's a lot of interaction with governments and repressive governments can get access to some of this information. Um, you know, and, and there is a shift. I mean, you know, whether it's PN, you know, PNAS, uh, AAAS, the journals, um, you know, the Proceedings of the National Academy, whether Science Magazine, um, now actually uh, the APA as well, its journals, um, all of you now have done shifts to say um, a lot of these traditional, like the, the common rule doesn't apply to social media. It doesn't apply to a lot of this sensitive data. Um, and it's really fascinating uh, when you, you know, kind of look at the ethical shift that's occurred. I mean, it used to be that a lot of these data sets um, used to be things that were considered very sensitive. Um, and, you know, now, um, you know, it was, it was kind of shocking when, you know, PNAS said, um, you know, the, all those rules about uh, manipulation of social media, monitoring, all of those, especially for understanding population scale, we don't see those as, as, as issues anymore. So I think that landscape is changing dramatically and it's changing in a way that benefits academics looking for data sets for publications, not with, but ignoring the very real dangers to society. And I think that is a market shift um, that I've, I've you know, gotten statements from all the, the journals now of 
yes, we've totally changed on that now. We don't really see this at these ethical constraints the way we used to. We have to prioritize publication. We have to prioritize grant funding. We have to minimize the ability of societies, of citizens to protect themselves. It's kind of a, a very interesting uh, piece there that really is not getting a lot of discussion, I think. Right. Miguel Cascade. So I like to frame the discussion of ethics and data in a humanitarian context in a more positive lens, Bully, because I see and I have witnessed how this data can also be used as a mechanism for transparency and accountability of those centralized systems that are supposed to be helping the forgotten. When you show an image of the longest power outage in Puerto Rico in US history, and you say, where did people have to weigh the longest outages? I think that's very powerful. And it has ethical implications to put FEMA, Housing and Urban Development, Army Corps, these agencies which us taxpayers pay to protect our communities to task. The same can be said across the Global South. When we see all this helicopter humanitarian work going in, you know, feeding off of charities, and then the work doesn't get done. So creating mechanisms of accountability to track the effectiveness of electrification programs across Africa is, is something, is one example where um, there, there are still some ethical dilemmas, but you're, you're trying to concentrate on, on the, so that the positive aspects, absolutely true. You know, we have to be careful about issues of national security. You know, I, as, as I join Lighthouse, it's becoming a more, <laughs> I realize as like, oh my God, we've got a lot of stuff with this data. But we also need to make sure that uh, we offer solutions in terms of equity and justice. Great, Casket. Uh, Budu, I love what you said about our ability to detect populations who are vulnerable, who with that information may lead to bad actions, whether that's by government or other people. And I, it's something I think about all the time um, when I contrast it with what McGill said it from a ham humanitarian standpoint. And I think I tend to be more glasses half full and a little naive as to how some of these data sets we produce are used. Um, the second part of ethics that I've been thinking about is whether providing data, human settlement data or hazard data or a climate forecast that we're not very certain about is better than providing no information at all in a humanitarian standpoint. And I don't have a good answer for that, but it is something I'm becoming more mindful of is as, we, as I produce more data sets and make them more user-friendly is commuting, communicating that uncertainty, but again, whether putting it in someone's hat, hands will actually just lead to worse decisions or overconfidence in a decision-making framework. And I don't have a good answer for that, but it's definitely on my mind. So I really appreciate this question. Bulu, I'm sorry. I would like to add the bad actors, unfortunately, there are more and newer bad actors who are figuring out ways to use this data in ways that impact uh, displacements. And I'll, I'll say it out loud because I don't care. Look at Airbnb and the land grab that happens after disasters where they go in and say, oh, we're going to give free rent to people. Yes, but then you're, you're pop overpopulating these Airbnbs in, in places where land is extremely limited. And now people cannot live there. Look what happened in Barbuda where people are, had to evacuate. And when they came back, their lands were taken away. Uh, by commercial bad actors. So I think we have to be, you know, eth like I say, very ethical about policing, not just the traditional conflict-driven actors, but the, the ones that are actually intensifying the inequalities in a displacement context. And I'll, and I'll add one piece of that. You know, our, our approach has always been to work with local communities. You know, so much of this sort of data analysis is, you know, folks here in the US or Europe, using mass amounts of data and describing, you know, like taking solid imagery and analyzing it and saying, here are the refugee settlements that we're observing in this country, here's what we're seeing. 
Um, you know, our philosophy has always been the opposite of working with communities and saying, here's what we can observe about your community. Um, what of that is useful to you? What of that is sensitive to the general public? And allowing them to make those informed decisions. And I think that's an inversion of the academic world because, again, academia, is, that isn't academia. Um, but I think that's something that really has to maybe become sort of the future of when we think about this. Because at the end of the day, these are real people's lives. And if you know a professor in America publishes this big paper uh, saying, "Hey, look, we found all these all these hidden settlements here, and we've mapped out where all these people are going," and that's an area where you know they can run right into to, to death. I mean, that that's a huge thing. Uh, great. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, and we have about uh, four minutes remaining. So, um, I would like to solicit your last thoughts um, on. You know, do you perceive any technologies that might be emerging um, in, in, in the next, you know, five to 10 years that would significantly, you know, impact or influence this particular area? That's a good one. Um, you know, Blue, I honestly think that we have a technology backlog. We are swimming in data. And we're still like, look at our nighttime lights. We're still trying to make sense of new technologies. And we're living, you know, at least on our sector in an embarrassment of riches when it comes to data. The problem, as you have stated and others have stated, is that policymaking isn't catching up to, to these advances. And, you know, like I couldn't understand, I mean, Caleb, Caleb put it perfectly, you have, you know, the government way of doing it, you know, the other academic way of doing it, we are so ahead of the curve in, in being able to provide informed decision-making and yet it hasn't scaled. And I'll be very frank, it hasn't even scaled in our decisions around the future of investing in science programs. You look at the current Earth science decadal survey, you look at reports that I talked about, I think um, the, the, the Cascade was talking about on the climate assessment. They're, they've already expired. And so I think part of it is, you know, what do we do with what we have? I, I'm looking, I, I know Dr. Karen St. Germain says sometimes at NASA, our, our, um, our headlights are looking down, they're not looking up. Because <laughs> we have so many things happening. Great, thank you, Miguel. Any last quick thoughts? Yeah, very, very quickly, I, I will say, uh, I'm most excited to, to use the technologies we already have and, and and work with communities on the ground who may not benefit from them. I mean, one area that I'm working on more recently is just extreme heat and, and population exposure and just working with local communities on proving weather forecasts because we already have those technologies and they're really good in some regions of the world and they're not so good in other regions of the world, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel for a lot of these regions that don't have good weather forecasts. So it's I know that's tangential from this conversation, but. And I'd say from, from my perspective, you know, one of the challenges is we have so much data today. Um, the trick is what we lack is analysis. Um, you know, our government, the intelligence agencies, for example, um, you know, if you look at, say, the CIA Museum, um, is filled with things to collect information. There's not a lot of emphasis on what do we actually do with it when we have it. We, you know, we, we kind of, as governments we, we, and academics, we specialize in, in acquiring these vast troves of data. Um, but the end result is how do we actually what we, we lack is those those tools and we have actually a lot of the technologies it's the the methodological workflows to to leverage the tools and data that we have to make new insights from what we already have great so with that i wanted to thank miguel cascade and caleb all of you uh, and pat and harvey for planning and designing this uh, wonderful panel this was fascinating, one of the best I have um, seen in recent times in terms of the depth and breadth and, and the insights that you have shared. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over. I guess we are going into a break right now. Is that correct? Yeah, so we, we, um, we are gonna go into a break um, and then we reconvene in about 15 minutes at 3.45 for our last and not least and most exciting panel on mixed methods analysis of migration, displacements and human dynamics that and the panel will be conducted by
you know, other than our um, wonderful colleague, Elizabeth Root. So um, see you everybody at 345. Hi, welcome back, folks. Um, we are about to start panel three, um, which is on mixed methods analysis of migration, displacement, and human dynamics. Um, in this next session, we have three separate talks on using mixed methods to analyze migration and displacement and human dynamics. And again, as with previous panels, each talk will be about 15 minutes and we'll hold questions from the committee and all of those of you who are listening through the webcast um, until we've heard from all three of our panelists today. Um, I'm fairly excited about this uh, session. We had a great meeting last week to sort of touch base uh, with the panelists. And it's clear that we have a really interesting mix of different ways in which people are measuring and visualizing and understanding human mobility. Um, and it offers a great diversity um, across uh, different space and time scales and whatnot. So with that, our first uh, speaker is uh, Samaya Dodge from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So Samaya, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, let me share my screen. Do you see my presentation slide? Yes, it looks great. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to present a portion of my work regarding to mobility and responses to COVID, specifically as a environmental disruption to our daily life. Um, um, uh, it was a, a fantastic first um, a few panels and I really enjoyed the conversations and the discussion. And I think what I'm presenting today really um, relates to the discussion we had right after the last panel about data quality and representativeness. Um, so starting with the pandemic, um, a lot of uh, companies and organizations started to share uh, mobility data at different scales, spatially and temporally. Um, these data sets often were calculated based on cell phone traces, like if you are using cell phone and we have location services on, uh, we've been counted. So on the left, uh, lower, part animation, you see an animation that was created by New York Times about raw cell phone traces obtained uh, with, uh, by a cubic company. And they showed that uh, you can learn a lot about these people, although they are anonymous traces. Although not uh, always we have access to uh, GPS tr uh, traces for good reasons because of privacy issues, but these uh, traces are used to calculate aggregate mobility indicators that indicate how much, for example, people move in general and how much or how many people are moving. So a lot of companies uh, like uh, Cubic, Descartes Labs, SafeGraph, Facebook, Apple, Mapbox um, started sharing this data with academic community to basically explore the patterns that we see in the data. And this data has been used a lot uh, with uh, um, during COVID for different studies, like looking at the impact of non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, such as stay-at-home orders on the spread of COVID or modeling COVID itself. And also it has been used to inform policy uh, in terms of making um, uh, non-pharmaceutical -ph intervention policies. So there has been a lot of studies and publications in this area, but oftentimes these uh, studies focus on one um, particular data set or use a data set or two sources of data to make uh, these analysis and modeling. What we wanted to do here, use this data to look at the quality that data represent and also uh, basically uh, to see whether different data sets gives us different story in terms of mobility patterns in a space and time. Throughout the pandemic in 2020, uh, we started collecting a lot of uh, data set from different companies and look at the patterns. So here, what I'm showing you uh, is just four um, sources of data uh, obtained from Place IQ, Descartes Lab, Cubic, and SafeGraph, because these were the four sources that uh, basically provided their user base, number of cell phones, scenes, 
um, that we're seeing in their data set. So if you correlate this with the population density of um, these data sets, uh, well, uh, the population density of the counties, because these data sets are obtained at the county level, um, you can see some, uh, some of the counties that represent large metro areas, such as Los Angeles, uh, also Harrison County in Texas, Texas or um, Cook County in Illinois, there is an underrepresentation of actual population with this data set. So we need to be mindful about what data source we use and how uh, the population is represented in this data set. Next, we looked at about nine, um, 26 different index, uh, indices from uh, nine different sources and looked at the coverage in the spatial, uh, the spatial and temporal coverage of the data. So how, uh, the missingness of the data or how much uh, coverage ava is available. So here the color basically represent when the data is complete, you see darker colors when the data is incomplete, meaning that there are missing dates that are represented in each county, you see lighter colors. So, um, uh, some of these uh, sources provide really complete, a complete representation throughout the year. However, some uh, free sources like Google visits and uh, Apple data sets, there are a lot of um, missing data in the data set. Similarly, for the uh, temporal representation of the data, we have counties that we don't have data for several weeks. So we need to be careful about when we are averaging and using this data set uh, uh, when there is missing information. So then uh, we wanted to explore uh, and compare uh, the patterns using different data sets. And for that, we use uh, spatial autocorrelation and try to cluster, uh, to find clusters of mobility patterns throughout uh, the COVID-19 pandemic at different locations using county level data that were obtained at the weekly basis or were average at the weekly basis. So using LISA, we created a visual analytic tools that has ability to uh, for the users to explore these patterns uh, computed uh, with LISA and uh, the basically patterns show hot spots and cold spots. Hot spots represent higher values clustered together with neighboring higher values and cold spots represent lower values close to other lower values. So in general, without giving much information at this stage, because I'm gonna focus on different uh, states later and give you more information, we can see a general agreement between cubic as a data, data source that you can buy uh, in this data, so you need to pay for a license fee and save graph as a free source of uh, data set. So, um, and I'm showing two different indices. One is um, mobility index or median distance traveled, which basically represent how far people moved. And then um, the shelter in place basically represent the percentage of people that has stayed at home um, during this timeline. So if we looked at this different um, maps, we see a general agreement between the shelter in place data set between cubic and safe graph, which uh, there are a lot of cold spots in the Midwest and South, meaning that uh, pe less people shared that in place and more people moved. And there are some hot spots in the Northwest and East, uh, sorry, Northeast and West, uh, representing less people moved and more people shared that in place. However, we don't see this um, agreement in the uh, data source that represent the, um, the, the distances travel. And uh, one reason could be because of the way in which these uh, indices are calculated. The algorithms to compute distance is more complicated than just counting the number of people. So the tool is available uh, at this link that I provided if you want to download and explore, and there is an interactive version of it that I'm going to show next uh, online. So 
The visual analytic that we uh, created has two components. The first component is a hot spot um, and cold spot recency and consistency map, which represents basically how often and how recent different counties were uh, cl classified as a significant hot spot and cold spot. You can zoom in and see different counties in different states. And basically the size of the dots represent the consistency in the behavior of being a hot spot or cold spot, the size at uh, the larger dots represent the, uh, the frequent um, cluster and the color, the lighter color represent the older clusters in the timeline and the darker color represent a more recent hot spots and cold spots. And then the next component is when, uh, so previous component, you would, could see more spatial patterns. Here we are looking at patterns over time, how consistent these clusters were over time. So if you see an angled um, line at 45 angle, you, you will see a, a county, basically represent a county that was consistently a hot spot or cold spot, and horizontal lines indicates that uh, the county changed behavior to not being a significant cold spot or hot spots. Next, I will um, basically uh, this um, uh, representation, in the, uh, we can use that to look at how different time of, uh, timelines of COVID impacted mobility patterns. For example, we can see in California and Pennsylvania, people started to shelter more in place, like less people moved as uh, when the state at home order started. But then in Pennsylvania, we see a change in behavior that is that uh, when the uh, social distancing, um, maybe orders left it, uh, there was no significant hot spot, cold spot. And towards the end of the year, they, again, there was an, uh, another policy which made people uh, stay at home more. So now here I'm zooming into Georgia as an example to look at how the patterns show different um, uh, different information uh, in terms of spatial patterns and temporal patterns. So looking at these two uh, uh, data obtained from Cubic and SafeGraph, basically in general we see distinct patterns differentiating rural versus urban counties, uh, especially for Atlanta, which exhibit. Um, Atlanta exhibits uh, basically a hot spot behavior, but we see some differences between the two the data set, although they both agree that Atlanta was a significant hot spot, meaning that more people stayed at home. However, other places, maybe less, um, that are not in large metro area, we see a significant cold spot that oftentimes also reacting to different timelines of COVID or political situation. For example, uh, we see an uptake of uh, people moving more after the presidential election or uh, around the Thanksgiving um, uh, like timeline uh, holidays. And also we see a change uh, and um, generating more hot spots around the second peak of the COVID um, uh, spread uh, uh, around July 28th. So uh, another uh, very interesting pattern uh, is observed in South Dakota, although uh, we don't see that distinct uh, differentiation between rural and large urban areas. We see a very distinct geographic patterns that is separated using based on Mississippi River. So we see an East River region and West River region. The East River region is mostly, uh, mostly corn and wheat agricultural production areas and a West River region predominantly are ranch and uh, dry land farming and mining operations. And there are some uh, Indian um, uh, uh, counties that represent um, Native American uh, majority in uh, basically the West um, 
areas. So if you look at these patterns, we mainly see uh, hot spots in the west and cold spots in the east. Um, however, the recency and consistency of these patterns changes with the different data sets. We see also, uh, we, we don't see a very significant response to uh, like or through time, if you look at the timeline. However, um, uh, but, and maybe it's because uh, South Dakota didn't have any state-wise uh, stay-at-home order situation here. So um, to basically recap what I showed, uh, here um, there is a a summary of all the states that we just talked about and the percentage of number of cold spots and hot spots created based on the data sets used using travel distance and shelter at home. So if we had consistency between the across different data set, we would see all these cold spots and hot spots would line up. However, we don't see that here. So I uh, would like to um, basically summarize um, these points on two different aspects of what I just present. One would be focusing on visual analytics and how we can uh, basically, how we leverage visualization to inform our quantitative analysis. So we basically combine qualitative assessment of what we see in terms of patterns with quantitative uh, analysis of these patterns uh, and what the data represents. So it is important to bring the uh, mapping and a qualitative um, analysis into quantitative um, uh, modeling as well. And also it is important to look at how these um, basically um, visualization actually uh, inform us. So we need to do some user studies to make sure that these visualizations are not misinforming us either. Another aspect uh, that I would like to touch on is um, data quality and uncertainty that we had a discussion about. So basically one important aspect, one um, issue that might come up is because these, um, there is no a standard on how these mobility indices are calculated. Different companies have different algorithms. So sometimes the algorithms changes through uh, time as well. So even the comparison between the same index from the same uh, provider there might be fuzzy as well. There is obviously, I showed that there is the bias in the data and representativeness issue that we need to consider. And uh, also uh, these data, we are not sure what population they are covering um, because we have this data set, compute this data set at uh, like um, aggregate level and not a specific population level. So we need to perhaps inform this data with more information about socio-demographic and geographic structures of these communities. For example, here, if you look at the timeline of uh, from 2019, which is before COVID, like the year that was a normal lay year, and then the year, next year, 2020, when COVID happened, you see a change in the uh, behavior when higher income population started to moving less than before and where uh, lower income population were more impacted and their behavior fully meaning that they even move more than people with uh, of a higher income. And with that, I would like to stop here and happy to be to answer any question. And I would like also to thank my students who contributed uh, to this research. Thank you so much, Samaria. That was really interesting. And I just really appreciate um, a critical view and a comparison of different sources of data that is so widely used and adopted, especially as we saw during the COVID pandemic. So uh, just wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So I'm going, yeah, I'm going to uh, introduce our next uh, talk, which is actually by a, um, a team of speakers. We have Kate Hess and Matt Woodleaf, who are from ESRI or ESRI, um, who will be presenting um, uh, in, the, in the next round. So Matt and Kate, I would, there we are. Thank you so much. I will turn it over. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to the 
um, to the group for inviting us here. It's really exciting when we get to you share some of the stuff that we've been been working on. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, a little presentation here and on using mixed methods approaches to understanding migration with, with GIS. So since its founding in 1951, the United Nations High Council on Refugees, the UNHCR, has been tabulating displaced persons. Uh, in 2017, the UNHCR produced the story map that you see on your screen right now. And at that time, more than 50 million people had been forced from their homes due to war, sectarian violence, uh, and natural disasters. But if we fast forward just five years, the UNHCR now estimates that there are 80, well, 89, 89 million people uh, have been forcibly displaced. We felt that these raw numbers, however, were not really telling the whole story. Uh, we wanted to find a broader story by bringing together the different patterns of data and creating a narrative that could answer questions such as, where are people fleeing from? Where are they going? And are there countries that are more desirable for those seeking asylum? And lastly, are we able to tie specific government policies to an increased number of displaced persons? So once we had these patterns of data at hand, we wanted to get into the personal aspect of the crisis. So in addition to looking at the refugee numbers, we needed to assess refugees at the individual level and do some qualitative analysis. So once migrating, do the refugees feel safe? Are the conditions in refugee camps adequate? How do individuals feel about the future? And maybe most importantly, what can we do to help? Yeah, and so the process we followed was to quantify the migration of displaced persons first. We wanted to know which countries they were leaving and which countries they were turning to for asylum. To do this quantitative analysis, we used a flow or a link map. And we plotted the country of origin and the current country of residency by first spatially enabling the UNHCR data set by geocoding the countries uh, based on their centroid. Then we calculated the total number of persons of concern uh, and symbolized the lines to connect the origin and the destination. Immediately, we saw the scope of the crisis. There does not appear to be a single country not affected by the refugee crisis. And through this simple mapping method, we were able to get some key insights. First, by symbolizing the countries country circles by in degree, we were able to identify countries that had refugees coming from many more locations. We normalized the node values here to show the comparative difference between values of displaced persons per destination country. As you can see on the map, the United States, Canada, Australia down here, and Norway and Sweden make up a large, uh, taking refugees from all over the world. So their nodes are comparatively larger than the other nodes on the screen. We are also able to illustrate the flow of refugees by varying line thickness based on the calculated total. So let's look at the Syrian Arab Republic for an example. We wanted to know uh, in this case, the line thickness here varies depending on how many people are connecting the origin to the destination. So first, we see Syrians fleeing to Turkey. We see them fleeing to neighboring Lebanon. Uh, at one point, we actually even see Iraqis fleeing into Syria, right? But the most important or the most intriguing arrow to us uh, was the one that is circling back in upon itself. This arrow represents the internally displaced people. It is the thickest line on our, on our chart, our map. So we can assume that most Syrians did actually not, did not flee to neighboring countries, but sought refuge within their homes. Well, so the map provided some key insights, but as I mentioned earlier, the UNHCR has been collecting data on refugees since 1951. Uh, and the origin of refugees since 1960. So I want to show you what the raw data table looks like. In this raw data table, we have nearly 120,000 records uh, representing millions of people, right? So as such, while the map could provide key insights, 
it was much too hard to identify patterns and, any, and gain a uh, significant understanding of the situation. But it still pointed us in an interesting direction. So we decided upon using an interactive timeline to drive the other visualizations. So let's take a look at 2017. So as I click through this interactive timeline from 2017 to 2021, I want to pay all of you pay special attention to uh, this summary total down here of internally displaced persons. So starting 2017 to 2018, we see a while the numbers all change, we see much bigger jumps within this population, including this 2.3 million 2.3 million person jump between 2017 and 2018. And then again, another 2.3 million person jump between 2020 and 2021. And so this uh, insight here triggered another round of analysis for us. We shifted our focus to analyze internally displaced persons. We wanted to gain an understanding uh, if, uh, if or how policies established by government had any influence over whether people left the country entirely or stayed within the borders of their homeland. And for this, we looked into the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar as our case study. So the Rohingya have long been targets of violence, both by individual groups and the government. And in fact, in 1982, the citizenship law uh, specifically left the Rohingya off the list of national races and prevented them from ever gaining citizenship. This is significant because the Rohingya are now classified as stateless persons. I'm starting in 2000 here. In the mid 2000s, the government began a household registration campaign in which families of Rohingya were gathered and a photo was taken. And anyone not in that photo would not be part of the family and could not legally stay in Myanmar. And as you can see in the bubble chart here, many were able to find refuge in neighboring Thailand. However, Thailand soon enacted policies to slow the admittance of Rohingya into Thailand. And we see that reflected in our data set. In fact, many of those policies began in 2006. And we start to see a couple interesting patterns emerge here. First, Bangladesh, it makes its first appearance uh, as a destination. And we also start seeing our first internally displaced persons. Let's fast forward to 2010. In 2010, the government of Myanmar began its violent crackdown on the Rohingya. Many were now able to flee to Bangladesh and it became the country at which most sought asylum. However, in 2012, the Bangladeshi government officially tried to close its borders to Rohingya. And in this case, we see a decrease in country asylum being Bangladesh and a massive increase of internally displaced persons. In fact, it's 62,000 in 2010 and becomes over 430,000 in 2012. It was also in 2012 where authorities in Myanmar forced the relocation of Rohingya into internment camps and severely restricted their access to travel, work, education, and healthcare. And the last part I want to take a look at is in 2017. In 2017, in response to an attack on police posts and crews by Rohingya militants, the military of Myanmar began a massive scale clearance operation and left with the choice of being killed or being forced to flee their homeland, many Rohingya decided to flee to Bangladesh. And we see that reflected in the chart. Nearly 1 million people left the homeland to seek refuge. And to this day, in 2021, Bangladesh remains the country that most seek asylum into. But however, Bangladesh is not where our story ends. Instead, it's actually the beginning of the next phase of our analysis. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kate. Great, thanks, Matt. So we've spent quite a bit of time quantifying the refugee crisis, but the crisis is more than just the numbers in the workbook. We wanted to explore the human condition and really qualify the crisis. 
So what do they need and do those needs have seasonality? How do they feel about their situation? And again, how can we help? So using geospatial solutions, we're able to take the static data tables and tedious data tabulation and turn it into more real-time analysis. This dashboard shows how survey results can be tabulated in real time. The first tab here is the survey as it was received from UNHCR upon download. It asks good questions, but we wanted to add some additional questions that would better assess the spatial and temporal resolution of the crisis. So we've added questions like how long have they spent in the camp and from which region of the country did they come? We also added some semi-structured questions that would be more amenable to a qualitative methodology. These allow us to use thematic coding and are less constrained than the other question types. This is important because we're seeing gaps in the data versus the lived experience of refugees. For example, when it comes to sanitation, the results from the survey show that a vast majority of people are satisfied with the sanitation conditions in the refugee camps. But by conducting proximity and walk time analysis, we can see a different story. Each one of the rectangles here are tents that were detected using GeoAI methodologies from drone imagery shared by the International Organization for Migration. After analysis, it was concluded that 37% of the population living in these refugee camps did not have adequate allocation of washroom resources. So that's nearly 12,000 people. Elucidating these gaps in the data set directs us to evaluate the survey instrument and can lead to refinement for the next iteration of the survey. This highlights how by using a mixed methods approach, we can use quantitative data to understand where more qualitative analysis may be needed. From our approach, we realize there is much more we need to learn about the individual respondents to the survey and discover why their experiences were not that of the majority. We've summarized this work in a story map where we can provide the background and context to the analysis. And we'll share out a link to this as well. The second half of the project we've shown today, the goal was to evaluate satisfaction with the quality of life within the Rohingya refugee camps. So this ties specifically into Sustainable Development Goal 6, which is available clean water and sanitation. Now, if we're just looking at the UNHCR survey findings, we get the impression that sanitation is satisfactory in the camps and people are happy with the conditions, saying quotes like that the available hygiene is improving. But when we bring in the additional data sources and approaches like quantifying buildings and washrooms from aerial imagery and including more open-ended survey questions for additional qualitative input, we're able to get a fuller picture of those conditions on the ground. And in this case, identify where there's still a lack of sanitation facilities. Ultimately, having these more comprehensive data-driven insights enables decision makers to help people in the ways that they need it most. So here we have a list of some of the changes that have been made to Rohingya refugee camps as of June, 2020, including constructing new latrines and bathing facilities and increasing the number of households that have access to clean water and soap. And we've included a link to the full report here where you can see additional details on the actions being taken on the ground to improve sanitation and safe water access. So in this exercise, we identified maybe the three main conclusions. So first, insights across a diversity of visualizations are necessary to tell a cohesive story, rather than just the diversity of the type of data collected. This allowed us to find gaps in the traditional narrative around refugees. People will stay where they feel safe, and in the case of the Rohingya, they had no other option but to leave their homes due to government policies. Secondly, the iterative process between quantitative and qualitative was essential to understanding if the numbers reflected the sentiment of the Rohingya. The iterative process also allowed us to refine our survey instrument and get into the why behind the where and the what. And finally, collaboration between the methods and data sets, along with the personal collaboration, allowed us to dig deeper into the crisis and go beyond the numbers. This collaborative analytic approach allowed us to see the story more holistically and to find questions that could help us fill in the gaps between the data and the lived experience. And with that, let's turn to the next presenter. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kate and Matt. That was really, really wonderful. I loved the visualizations and this, uh, your description of the iterative process that really brought in qualitative understanding of what life was like on the ground in these refugee camps, just really is a great exemplar of how we can do mixed methods research and integrate sort of the lived experiences of people on the ground. So I'm sure you'll, I'm sure the audience will have tons of questions, um, but I, I thank you for your presentation. Um, and I would like to introduce our final speaker, Marie Urban from Oak Ridge National Labs. Marie, over to you. Hi, thank you. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> Oops, I have to hit the share button. Sorry about that. And there we go. All yes, right, it looks so, good. Great, thank you. So thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all um, today. And I've really enjoyed this whole um, discussion um, this afternoon as well. So I'll be discussing the um, application of qualitative and quantitative data um, around IDP and refugees for population modeling. So since the late, um, 70s, ORNL has been involved in developing spatially refined estimates for populations at risk. So initially in support of facility siting or shipment of um, hazardous materials. And because of this research, ORNL developed LandScan, a global population data set for consequence assessment, delivered in 1998 and continuous annual updates since 2000. It is the first global high resolution population distribution data set representing an unwarned population. So this unwarned population is a more realistic spatial representation of population across activity spaces, such as home, work, or school. Since the release of this global data set was nearly 25 years ago, which by the way, was well before geospatial data or the high resolution imagery that is now available, and through leveraging our high performance computing, computer vision and machine learning capabilities, there is a continued refinement of the spatial fidelity of LandScan with each new release. Our next release is LandScan 2021, which will occur next month. So this is um, a high level representation of the LandScan remote sensing based global data modeling and mapping method. Um, I know C Cascade talked earlier about um, gridded population um, data sets, and so that's kind of a nice segue into um, what I'm talking about today, um, specifically about LandScan. Um, this is, um, LandScan is a top-down multivariable decimetric population modeling approach conducted by disaggregating census counts within subnational administrative boundaries so the landscape population distribution models are tailored to match the data conditions and geographic nature of each individual country and region. So basically we develop a likelihood surface. So where people are most likely to be found. And this is performed using ancillary spatial data and high resolution imagery exploitation. We then distribute the census populations to small areas within the census units based on the values in the likelihood surface. Um, the displaced population, I, IDPs and refugees, are then accounted for through data-driven mixed methods. Um, so, you know, I don't have enough time to discuss everything about the LandScan um, modeling, but you can find more information out at landscan.ornl.gov. So what causes population displacement and resettlement? Um, you know, there's a, a lot of different events, you know, short-term events like conflict or persecution, um, social and political instability, natural disasters, and then there's the long-term events, right? Food insecurity, water stress, but then the short-term events can become the long-term events as well. And then for, um, uh, you know, kind of the typical background migration, your census captures those movements. Um, <clears throat> so here, um, the Kosovo refugee crisis was the first LandScan update to account for IDP and refugee movements. 
Um, we used open source information, humanitarian reports, and media about locations and displaced populations to update the population distribution. So by the end of April 1999, about 600,000 residents of Kosovo had become refugees. Another 400,000 were displaced inside Kosovo. Overall, there were 2 million residents in uh, Kosovo and nearly half of the residents became refugees or internal displaced people. So you can see that largest spike um, uh, in the graphic below is about 375,000 Kosovars moved, moving south to neighboring Albania. And then there's about 150,000 um, who moved to uh, Macedonia. And you can see those spikes throughout the um, graphic below and the movement of, of the refugees and IDPs. So normally we identify new or monitor continuing events of population displacement through humanitarian or other open source resources. However, you know, you know, some events are rapidly evolving situations that require assistance immediately. So if we use Ukraine as an example, um, the, being the most recent continuing conflict um, where bordering countries and humanitarian organizations provide housing and supplies to IDPs and refugees. The other example is, is kind of piggybacking on um, Matt's discussion about uh, Myanmar. Um, the Rohingya, um, how in uh, August 2017, uh, there are nearly 1 million Rohingyas that uh, refugees fleeing to Bangladesh to settle in Cox Bazar refugee camp. And then of course, smaller numbers of refugees in surrounding countries. For these types of situations, and this has been discussed all day, there, there's often a shorter term need for information that can aid in estimating damage and providing relief to affected people. So there isn't a, you know, a single authoritative reporting uh, source, but rather multiple organizations and media that report the rapidly changing situations. For example, UNHCR, which we, we heard about earlier, um, Global Conflict Tracker, you know, Displacement Tracking Matrix um, by IOM. Um, and you know, there's, even with all those, that reporting, there's less reporting on the resettlement of re refugees, especially IDPs. So it's um, often difficult to track the resettlement. Um, and last of all, aligning disparate data sources and earth observation data for population modeling um, is it can be very challenging. Um, and so what happens, whoops, I'm sorry, my apologies, <laughs> is that we end up with a really complex challenge in um, trying to account for uh, refugees and IDPs in our population modeling. So for population modeling, um, unaccounted refugees, uh, you know, fr from the qualitative data um, side of things, um, you know, there's, cultural practices of um, things like offers to refugees or IDPs to stay with local families. And so those are hard to track, but sometimes you can get information from anecdotal reporting, um, maybe from some of the discussion within uh, media and other organizations about displacements, like kind of the location to and from. Um, there's often behavioral surveys, um, you know, they, they give, um, some insight into where refugees, IDPs were maybe initially displaced and then re-displaced. Um, we can also, we have the, the capability to detect um, change in growth and decline of camps. And so that change can um, lead to pursuit of new sources to understand the population growth or decline of those camps. And then um, most important um, for population modeling is understanding the building use. And so if there's any changes in that building use, it's imperative to understand that. Um, we often see uh, building use change once there's a displacement event. Ukraine, for example, people use museums, theaters, and churches as shelters, which then changes the building function and the expected number of people within the building. And then for population modeling, that's significant. Um, the, the last thing is um, 
you know, it's useful to identify the destroyed infrastructure. You know, if a building is destroyed, we consider it inhabitable and no populations would be distributed to that location. So for quantitative sources, we regularly collect open source and media population estimates to inform our population models for an area. Over the longer term, humanitarian organizations and NGOs report registered camp populations. Those can include detailed camp descriptions and demographics. So then we've also developed tools that exploit imagery in support of developing camp population estimates or capacities when those aren't reported. So here's an example of <clears throat> using overhead imagery to detect camp establishment and growth. Uh, these images show the rapid construction of IDP camps due to the mass Mosul exodus between October and November of 2016. So using counting tools, we can rapidly determine whether the capacity of camps supports the reported displaced population. In addition to comparing with reported counts, we can then pursue where the unaccounted refugees or IDPs may be found. So this is also an example of how alignment of reported population estimates in EO uh, Earth observation is important for land scan um, updates. Here's another example of using overhead imagery and reported estimates to understand population movements. So border crossings are important for monitoring population movements and identifying camps. This example is the Syria conflict and the opening of a former closed border into Iraq. Here, the number of refugees crossing went from 68,000 to over 200,000 over the course of the year. So what we typically see is that most refugees settled just past the border for minimum displacement, but also in hopes of return. Um, so we pull information from social media um, as well for most more insight into refugee and IDP activities. So these photos were pulled from discussion about humanitarian support. This is an example of two different impromptu facility uses that result in differing population estimates over time. So the facility on the left is a shelter and hosts a large population, whereas the facility on the right is a distribution center. So there's a large gathering of people outside the facility um, for the distribution center, but that is only for a short uh, time, a short period of time for that day. Um, this example, uh, this is an example of our capabilities um, in automated change detection to determine habitable buildings. So leveraging high performance computing and machine learning capabilities. So our ag algorithms are quickly detect buildings prior and post conflict. Um, this is a Mariupol. So the damaged buildings are rapidly identified to determine displaced populations and inhabitable buildings. Um, for land scan updates, populations are not distributed to the destroyed buildings. And so that's key for us to understand those. <clears throat> Um, here's another example of rapidly detecting change through building detection and counting to get us closer to the number of people affected by conflict. In this case, it's the Boko Haram who terrorized the city resulting in the loss of infrastructure and life. So using our um, building detection in, our, in addition to counting capability, the number of um, Sorry, the number of structures remaining quickly provides insight to, into how many households displaced. Sorry, let me go back. So we have over 10,000 uh, structures um, identified here and counted, and then um, under 10,000 after the Boko Haram moved through the area. Um, here's a close up where you can see the structures and the count, and then afterwards. Um, really see the damaged or, or destroyed buildings and, and fewer count. It should be noted that this example occurred during a time when, you know, digital trace data wasn't readily available and it may not be available yet in many areas of the world. Um, and so being able to monitor, see where people are moving um, isn't, you know, if we're looking at the global scale quite available yet, However, Ukraine was a great example of that happening 
I've seen many demonstrations of watching uh, the, the populations moving <clears throat> outside of Ukraine to neighboring countries. So um, <clears throat> Ornell developed the capability to continuously identify areas that may be experiencing power outage using beers and nighttime lights. Um, this is a dashboard. The, the legend on the left shows um, black as decreased lights, white as no change, yellow as increased lights, and gray as cloud cover. So in this image, there's quite a bit of cloud cover, but you can still get a glimpse of decreased and increased lights in parts of the country. Um, this capability supports rapidly detecting changes in outages, especially during natural disasters and gives insight into who is affected and may need support. So if communities are without power for too long, they potentially begin moving where they can find power and shelter. So last of all, um, this graphic is a visualization of population dynamics during the early stages of the Syrian conflict. So by now, and the estimate of internally displaced people has risen to between one and a half and two million. Um, the intense fighting is in densely populated urban areas cause more and more, um, sorry, the, the intense fighting has caused more and more people to uh, flee their homes seeking refuge in schools, dormitories, mosques, and other public buildings. So many have been displaced more than once fleeing from Homs to Damascus, for example, and then moving elsewhere in search of safety. And so you can see the large movements of population since we did a, a, a subtraction of the population to get a better understanding of the movement. So understanding the losses and gains, um, <clears throat> you can see many of the populations at this time, and this is of course in August, 2012, have moved north outside of Syria and south as well. And that's the end. Um, I'm happy to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Marie. Again, another wonderful example of how we can use sometimes called non-traditional data sources, but in reality, lots of different types of data that have both a qualitative and a quantitative aspect to it to help us understand really complex social problems. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I first would like to um, offer the opportunity for the committee members to ask a question. If anybody on the committee, um, go ahead and raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. And I would say again, uh, remind public attendees watching the webcast that if you have an idea or a question that you would like, please put it in the Slido and we'll work those into our conversation at the end of this panel. So committee, sorry, uh, any questions? Harvey, please. I th again, thanks for thanks for another great panel. Um, I don't know if this is a well-formed question, but something I've been thinking about is that when we talk about mixed methods, it seems like we're still loosely coupling quantitative and qualitative data. We can see that with story maps, where basically we're telling interesting narratives, but we're just basically geo-referencing. Um, like media. I'm wondering if you could speculate what are better ways to think about next generation of integrating qualitative and quantitative information. I mean, is, is there a better way than just, you know, um, measurement and exploration or using qualitative data to, to inform how we do our, our quantitative, how we interpret quantitative findings? Is there a better way to bring these data together? Like I said, that may not be a very well-formed question, but I, I just have a feeling that we're still in the first generation, at least in the geospatial realm, of integrating these types of data, and, and there, there are more advanced ways of doing this. Yeah, I guess I can take a stab at, at answering that question. Um, so I guess maybe one of the more um, exciting things coming out of geospatial is the ability to uh, map natural language processing. So, um, from for example, the the GDELT that we saw earlier, um, we can take that information and put it on a map, right? Which is half the battle of finding uh, out about anything. So that the context really does matter of where things are happening. 
Um, so I think going forward and seeing those future developments in the natural language processing and being able to get the data faster rather than waiting for reports to come out or being able to download some data and have to explore it to find our, our narrative like Kate and I did. Um, I'm optimistic that, that can be something in the future that will help us explore data faster and understand it faster. Maybe provide a quicker link between the qualitative and the quantitative. And I don't know if that was a well-formed answer, but that was my... <laughs> it's as good as my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, are there other panelists? Maya. Yeah, I uh, I would add maybe um, you know using leveraging visualization and visual analytics, maybe we can uh, develop more flexible visual analytics tools that are better coupled with um, like both bringing both qualitative and quantitative data set together. So uh, in the background in visual analytics, we have uh, data uh, machine learning techniques that are totally on. Uh, um, quantitative data using quantitative data, but uh, then we map the results. Can we do that on the fly by integrating uh, like information from imagery and as uh, Matt said, uh, like natural language processing to mine a qualitative data as well as quantitative data and map it. That would be interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Samaya. Yeah. So um, Marie, really mm -hmm. quick, um, I'll comment. Um, I think one thing that we're experiencing, and I, I think it was discussed earlier, is that we're in this huge, you know, we're, we're drowning in data, right? We just have so much of it. And I think, um, you know, at this point, we really have to focus what it is that we want to, to answer or get out of of the data and we're, we're in a position now where it will, we can't just, I don't know, I don't know if anyone does this anymore, but you know, use one or two, you know, data sets, it's gonna be pulling in multiple. So, you know, like I talked about earlier, we, we pull in so much different data and it's almost, you know, making sure that we have, if it's qualitative, quantitative, multiple sources to, to verify, you know, what's the quality of this data as well. And so, you know, moving forward, I mean, I think we'll continue to develop amazing tools to sort and sift through and understand the data and be able to answer, you know, continue to answer some challenging research questions, but also um, hopefully take into account, um, you know, how, how certain the data is as well. Oh, sorry if that was a little crazy, but mm -hmm. a little different. <laughs> well, that was good. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have two hands risen. I think, uh, Kirsten, you were you had your hand up first. Yeah, thank you. Um, you, you sort of answered some of the questions that I had um, and Harv um, was touching upon them because it seems as though your session really wrapped up nicely what we started in the beginning of the day where we were talking about um, you know, the real time data and Anna was talking about the, you know, the need of that. And then Lydia got into more of a design process. And then, you know, Steve was looking at this communication. Um, and so I guess it, it's, it's sort of a question about, um, again, back to all this data. And Marie, you in particular, I think we're starting to bring it into what are the crises? and what data is needed in each type of crisis that's happening. And it seems as though all of these um, approaches need different types of data. And so I guess maybe a question is, is anybody out there trying to organize this into here's the data that you need you know, for this type of crisis? Uh, because there is so much data out there flying around. And I think it's, it's uh, almost overwhelming for organizations and policymakers to try and figure out what bucket does this fall into? So is anybody doing any kind of work related to that? And I don't even know if that's even a question or a comment or just thoughts about it. Yeah, I can, I mean, so I have a, as it pertains to the Ukraine crisis, some of the departments in, in the UN and WHO uh, have been trying to build collaborative environments where they can transfer data back and forth, but still maintain 
the integrity of their own data sets so they can still choose what to share, uh, maintain that control over their own data, but make sure that the data transfer is faster. So rather than having to, to wait, right? That's, that's a big problem. We have to wait for this data. Well, if you have it, I know that you have it. We have a collaboration. Let's just share it um, right away, right? And start, and start acting, up, acting upon it. So I think we'll see some, maybe more of those at least more of those collaborative environments to, to share data uh, faster could be, could be a key in the future. I can. I might say, can I, can I add one thing, Samaya? So one of the things that I've observed is that there's, you know, while we have a lot of standards, sort of metadata standards that have been created for quantitative data, um, and, and there's, there's not one metadata standard, although there's a lot of effort, I think, that's been put into trying to create standards around how to structure data. There's still a lot of sort of diverse, um, you know, different groups are trying to develop their own. So I work with the food FAO, right, and the World Food Program, and they have just created this new data set called GIFT, which is supposed to curate and bring in all these food intake and food related data sets from around the world. And the metadata that they have on their website is structured differently than metadata that I would pull down from, say, the IPOMS effort, which is looking at more population surveys. So there's still this sort of diversity in what's required of a data set to kind of create a repository or even information in an informational repository about what's out there. I would say one of the great challenges with qualitative data is that those standards really don't exist, right? And it's partially because of where this is coming from and what disciplines it's coming out of, the more qualitative side of the research that's been conducted. But I also just think there hasn't been sort of more of a top down, like we've got to create some standards for qualitative data so that we could more widely disseminate it to people who might be interested in integrating it and using it. So I'd say that's actually a gap um, that, that we could um, look into and, and perhaps fix, although not everything's fixable, but at least start to structure that data so it could be integrated and more widely used. Um, Samaya, sorry. I yeah, I also yes. wanted to um, touch on that um, in regarding uh, metadata standards and um, having a uniform a policy or uh, like a centralized um, way of uh, like collecting a repository of mobility data that can be used for uh, looking at, um, you know, how mobility is changing uh, in response to disruptive uh, events. So the problem with mobility data is that um, they are collected by commercial companies and some organizations, and there are different policies, different standards, different ways of uh, computing uh, uh, movement indicators. And the problem is that um, a, a lot of these companies sell their data, right? So these are not free data sets. And uh, like, for example, like satellite imagery, land use data, these are easy to be um, coordinated with different companies and have a centralized um, repository or a data uh, source for that. However, with mobility data is basically the at the discretion of the data owner, how they want to share it, how much they want to share and how they are computing it. And there is no effort to bring all these different sources of data together. And that would be actually a, a challenge and next step to look into how we can uh, create a standard or central uh, uh, repository of uh, such data sets. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I think this sort of idea of standards around qualitative data is one that is really important, actually, as there's sort of, uh, you know, we talk about the exponential growth of data. And I would th say that that's no different for qualitative forms of information that we could use uh, as data in our, in our research and our analyses. Uh, Miguel, I see you have your hand up as well. Yes, thanks, Elizabeth. I am uh, very curious to hear perhaps um, Kate and Matthew's opinions about sort of the proliferation of the digital twin model in, in this area. And I saw, hey, Matthew, I saw you grin. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> we're all geographers, I think, in this room. And we've been, I mean, I, my first S3 conference, user conference was in Taiwan, was in 2001. And I was in a meeting like 21 years later in Europe and they're talking about these amazing DRG. And it's like, 
that looks a lot like a GIS. <laughs> and are we repackaging? You know, I think they were trying to repackage a solution that is based on very fundamental geospatial analysis principles. And it's partly, I don't know, maybe it's because industry is not aware of the state of the science. What's the disconnect and what's sort of your opinion in terms of do we have, do I have to now, every time I wrote a proposal, replace the name GIS with zero twin to get it selected? I mean, like, I don't, I don't understand what's going on. So I just wanted to get your perspective within this context, because I think there's sort of a integration gets into the issue of the integration that I spoke about earlier. Uh, is that the solution or do you think, what are your opinions personally? You don't have to talk about, you know, your co you know, your company's perspective, but. Yeah, I can take that one. So. <laughs> okay. Kate. That's why I was pretty. <laughs> Kate said, yeah, Kate said is... the presentation on digital twins is like right up reality. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to answer it. <laughs> so I would say with digital twins, it is a bit of a just kind of fashionable term right now. Um, but I think it can kind of incorporate existing GIS concepts and then in some cases extends them a little bit further. So I think just having digital twins exist at such a different range of scales. You could have a digital twin of an entire country or of just the processes happening in one factory. And I think digital twins really need GIS kind of as a basis because they're capturing the relationships between different processes and objects. And that inherently is gonna include how they're related in space. So I think it's adding something a little bit new maybe to the existing field of GIS and what has been already kind of the standards of how people work with data. Um, but I think it is adding some new benefits to kind of how we can think about data and how things are related to each other and gives us really that ability to take things a step further from just visualizing how things are interacting now and performing kind of projections and looking at different future scenarios and how that will impact all of the different current components of our system of our digital twin. And just wanted to add that I think the digital twin concept is really is about that data integration. GIS is just a tool to help integrate that data, but what you do with it at the end can help you build out so-called digital twin. So what systems are you modeling the interplay between the natural systems and the built environment? Um, how everything interacts and then how you can run analytics and models on those, I think that's what kind of turns the digital twin from like a 2D GI type of thing to a 3D full, no, well, digital twin, I guess. I guess another aspect of it is the scale um, of digital twin, like uh, how uh, granular you want to have that model and how that invade the privacy of, for example, if you think about mobility, I think that would be an uh, issue to consider. Thank you. Uh, I want. I do want to allow. I have one question from the from the webcast audience, and I would uh, like to bring that into our discussion. So, I actually have a very specific crash, uh, question about diasymmetric mapping. Um, and so, uh, the question was: Have diasymmetric mapping techniques been validated specifically with refugees and transient populations? Um, and uh, the more specific question is: Do you use the binary method or something else? So, if one of our panelists is, has a has used diasymmetric mapping has a thought on that, it'd be great to share. Um, I think I can start. I think, um, so the first question, sorry, Elizabeth, is um, has it been validated? <clears throat> or was yeah, that for specifically, one? yeah, validated specifically for refugee and transient, transient populations. Um, so I, you know, Asymmetric modeling is is really getting at how can you use you know how can you what how can you take this census data and disaggregate to what you know and and you're identifying if it's a, if it's a building um, what type of building that is and then as you're talking about refugees and transient populations um, those um, fold in nicely because you're saying, okay, if we have a refugee, for example, if we have a refugee camp, here's um, how many people within this area um, 
as I, I spoke before about, you know, pulling in different types of data to as, as kind of um, indicators of where people would be. And um, for the transient, um, you know, and validation, you know, validation is hard, um, first of all, because, you know, our, if you were to like, just look around you, how many people are here, we can count how many people are here at this moment. Like I can say, I'm in my office at this moment, how many people are in the building, but in another minute that changes, right? And so validation of the population of those estimates is difficult from that perspective. And when you start throwing transient populations in there, that adds another layer or dimension of, um, of difficulty. Um, then your account, you know, how are people moving and um, running simulations and understanding that movement and those patterns helps and can help with that validation. Um, but again, we get back to, you know, no one's staying in one place for, you know, uh, um, an inordinate amount of time. And so, so that, that, that uh, makes that validation part uh, a difficult. Thank you. Any other thoughts from our panel on diasymmetric mapping? <laughs> so we only actually have two minutes left um, in our panel this afternoon. Um, and so I, I did wanna ask one quick question that we had discussed as a panel. Um, and I, I think that, I think that one of the really interesting things about the different approaches that you've taken is that um, you examine the dynamics of migration and displacement at very different spatiotemporal scales, right? And we're all geographers. And so the space time nexus is, we know is very challenging. Um, but I might ask quickly for like two sentences or, or maybe, maybe four sentences on how, if the temporal scale of analysis changed the question, uh, how, would the, how would the question you're asking your data change, right? So like, yeah, anyway, so I'll leave it at that. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll go to Samaya first and then we can popcorn. Sure, uh, so uh, we were studying uh, COVID as a, a, you know, event that we were looking at and how that relates to uh, mobility. So for that, um, the temporal scales that we need to be able to relate patterns of mobility to COVID was at a daily or weekly basis. So if you had the data that comes in like monthly uh, resolution, then that would not be um, valuable, valuable for the processes that you are uh, trying to explore. So I guess that uh, it is important to uh, understand what processes we are looking at in terms of spatial and temporal scales and whether the data actually matches and this also temporal scale of the analysis matches that processes that we are uh, trying to capture. Um, I can, um, so yeah. for population modeling, we're always moving towards a higher temporal um, aspect of understanding where people are. And um, I think, you know, Samaya's work, she's, you know, getting at that, you know, minute by minute or, you know, high resolutions, uh, temporal scale, um, which is um, pretty incredible. And, and um, given where we are or what I've been talking about today and trying to capture cap, uh, refugees and IDPs, you know, just understanding um, those at, um, you know, maybe over a, a different temporal scale, which is more of months to years, given where they're at and how they're moving. Um, it, it's kind of puts it in a different dimension, if that makes sense, um, and, and changes the, that question of, of temporal um, scale. For our presentation, I'll let Matt kind of talk about his section that was looking at the multi-year analysis. But I think it's interesting with the survey and some of the uh, 
uh, drone imagery analysis that the section we were looking at today was really kind of a snapshot in time of just surveying people and how they're doing on the day they're surveyed and looking at the one day that the drone imagery was collected. But I think it can get really interesting if you're collecting the information multiple times and then can start to do a comparison of how things are changing and maybe evaluating how the, uh, if you're looking at drone imagery that's taken on another day and doing a change comparison to just identify how many new facilities have been built and recalculating that distribution of facilities per, per person and then comparing that with the more qualitative survey results and seeing how closely tied together those are with people's changing perspectives of the conditions versus what we can actually see or the conditions from looking at imagery. And looking at our temporal scale of the quantitative analysis, um, it was unfortunately, it was only, it was only a year, it's it year by year. So I think it was the aggregation of that year, but something that we were interested in uh, exploring was the seasonality of migration. Um, do people move more often when whatever weather is appropriate for it, right? Is, does weather have an impact of it? Um, does it have any sort of relationship between what we call the fighting season and the off season? Um, do people move sooner after, you know, holidays or religious events? Just trying to be able to find that information would have been, uh, I think would have been interesting to see how that changed the flow patterns uh, of migration to have more granularity in the in the seasons or the or even months per year so, so what we're looking at our insights this looks just like all right in one year all these people moved but they didn't move all at once right so we'd like to go back and try to understand now are they moving uh within the country are they are they especially the internally displaced persons are they going from one spot to another or are they making multiple stops along the way and that wasn't information that we had um but it would be really great if you could find that <laughs> <laughs> that's always the trick isn't it finding the data for that. um so with that i i, I believe that ends the, the third panel of our of our session this afternoon so i'd like to hand it um back over to i believe harvey to close us out for for the afternoon i thank you again thank you all again speakers it was a wonderful panel i really appreciate the time and effort you put in to to sharing your work with us thank you yeah, thanks for having us thank you yeah, what a great afternoon. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to panelists. Thanks to our keynote speaker. And thanks to members of the MSC and GSC for moderating these sessions. Lots of food for thought. Uh, we'll be discussing this internally and thinking about what are the next steps that we can act upon all these uh, wonderful ideas and thoughts and challenges we heard today. So on behalf of uh, Pat McDowell, the uh, chair of the Geographical Sciences Committee and myself, the chair of the Mapping Science Committee, um, we're calling this uh, meeting to a close. I want to thank all, again, all the participants, but also the audience for uh, listening in. I hope you um, learned a lot today and uh, can go forward and keep pushing the envelope in this very important area. Thank you all. And with that, we'll sign off. <laughs>